celebrating its 10th year as the world's leader in motorsports coverage presents Speed World. Today, live from Talladega Super Speedway in Alabama, the Winston 500. It is just a beautiful day here in Alabama. We have bright, sunny skies. The temperature is 65 degrees. It is a little breezy, but only a 10% chance of rain. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Bob Jenkins, and welcome to Talladega, the world's fastest speedway. Yes, this has been the place where the world's fastest stock car lap was turned by Bill Elliott over 212 miles an hour, and the fastest 500-mile race of any kind was also held here. But it isn't quite as fast as it used to be because of the restrictor plates that NASCAR is using on these Winston Cup cars. However, when you look at the statistics, you'll see that since they have started using the restrictor plates, more cars have been running at the finish, more cars have been on the lead lap, there have been fewer caution periods and a faster average speed. So it has led to greater competition. Let's get more on this restrictor plate as we go to the pit area and jack a -root. Bob, let's give you a little education about carburetor restrictor plates. Now, this is a base plate that all the Winston Cup competitors use, and they mount it beneath their carburetor, actually to give them enough room to have all the working parts work properly. Now, you can see the openings here. Now, a couple of years ago, they introduced these one-inch plates, and they put them beneath the base plate, and you can see the way it chokes off the air that goes into the manifold for the fuel mixture and therefore decreases the horsepower. Now, this year what they've done is they've introduced for Talladega a 15 16 plate. Now, you really can't tell the difference between the 15 16 and the one-inch plate with the naked eye, but for the lack of a better way to show you, we've put these little black lines. Now, that's 1 16 of an inch on a 15 16 Now, when you place that behind the plate, it decreases the horsepower by 40 horses, or as much as 5 miles an hour here at Talladega, Alabama. And for those of you that don't quite understand horsepower and how, how it relates to speed, imagine, if you will, in yesterday's Kentucky Derby, all 16 horses going to the post with one leg tied down. Well, Jack, a lot of the Ford drivers feel like they've been handicapped all year long. They have yet to visit Victory Lane. After their performance at Daytona, which was so disappointing, they had a problem. They were all sick. In fact, they were diagnosed with acute restrictor plate-itis. In fact, one car owner was concerned when he came here. He said, my car may not even make the field. Well, he was wrong. His car, driven by Mark Martin, sitting on the front row in the pole. He is joined in the front two rows by three fellow Ford drivers. On the outside front row, young Davey Allison and the Haviland Ford qualifying in fourth spot was Bill Elliott and along beside Elliott of course the car of Neil Bonnet but the much ballyhooed debut here of the Chevrolet Lumina the Chevrolet Lumina starting fifth in the field with Darrell Waltrip aboard and this is the only Chevrolet though qualifying in the top ten now a lot of Chevrolet people are concerned after six straight consecutive manufacturers championships by the Monte Carlo they have shelved the Monte Carlo and brought out the new Lumina but the concern in the garage area was minimal Many of the gurus feel maybe the Chevrolet drivers are sandbagging. Maybe they should change the name here from Talladega Super Speedway to Talladega Beach. Bob? So we have the restrictor plate, and we have a new race car, the Lumina. There is also the racetrack itself, which has some unusual characteristics. And a little bit earlier, Benny Parsons and Ned Jarrett took a look at one of these characteristics. Bob, the first time I came to Talladega to race was 1969. I'd been racing for six years, and I'd never seen a racetrack that the start-finish line wasn't there, in the middle of the front straightaway. And the first time I went to practice, I came in and asked some people, where is the flagman? Oh, he's the start-finish line. Well, pray tell, where is the start-finish line? And then they pointed it out to me. It's 1,200 feet on down the racetrack where Ned Jarrett is. And being 1,200 feet is almost the length of most drag strips where they can get up to 250 miles an hour in that distance. In fact, a number of races have been won here at Talladega from where Benny is to where I am here at the start-finish line. So that can be a big advantage. It gives them that much more to use the slingshot principle to get around another car. And we might see some of that here today. Now, another advantage to the drivers for the start-finish line being down here, you can see the exit of Pitt Road about 100 feet behind me. Now, if a caution comes out, normally the front runners will dive into the pits, especially if it comes out before they get into turn four. Okay, if you're a lap down, you stay out on the racetrack, you can get across the start-finish line before they get their service and get out here, so you've gained a lap back. And also, if you're interested in Winston Cup points, you might pick up five bonus points if you're in the lead lap by letting the others go into the pit. You stay out on the racetrack, get across the start-finish line, got yourself those five bonus points. I think we'll see a good bit of that come into play here today in the Winston 500. Bob? Thanks, Ned. And who will cross that finish line first? Well, we'll know in about three hours. The largest crowd in Alabama sports history is here to witness 
the Winston 500 at Talladega Super Speedway. Field begins to move out. We're just a few minutes away from the start of this 500-mile race at Talladega. We'll be back in just a moment. NASCAR's Winston Cup Division is here for the Winston 500 at Talladega, Alabama. The field on warm-up laps here as we're just moments away from the start of this event. Every 1989 race winner has started in the top 10, but here now is the complete starting lineup for today's Winston 500. 41 cars are standing by to take the green flag. On the pole will be Mark Martin in the number six Strolite Ford qualifying at 193.061 alongside Davey Allison. In the second row, it's Neil Bonnet in number 21, the Sitco Ford, and Bill Elliott in the Coors Belling Ford car number nine. The third row, Daryl Waltrip in the new Lumina, number 17. And outside will be Morgan Shepard in the Valvoline Pontiac car 75. The fourth row, Harry Gant in the number 33 Skull Band at Oldsmobile, and Phil Parsons, the defending champion of the race in the Crown Oldsmobile, number 55. In row number five, it's Terry Labonte in the Budweiser Ford car number 11 and Rick Wilson in the Kodak Film Oldsmobile car number four. The sixth row, A.J. Foyt from Houston, Texas is in the Copenhagen Oldsmobile car number 14 and Jeff Bodine in the Levi Garrett Chevrolet car five. The seventh row, Ricky Dick Trickle in the number 84 Miller High Life Buick and Kyle Petty from Randleman, North Carolina in the Peak Antifreeze Pontiac number 42. Richard Petty starts 15th in the STP Pontiac. Alongside will be Sterling Marvin in the Sunoco Ultra Oldsmobile. Going to row number nine, it's Dale Earnhardt in the GM Goodwin Chevrolet car three and Lake Speed in the Bullseye Barbecue Oldsmobile car number 83. In the 10th row, it's Phil Markdahl in car number 73, the Markdahl Racing Oldsmobile and Larry Pearson, another rookie candidate in the Chattanooga Chew Buick car number 16. In the 11th row, it's Ken Schrader, who was the fastest second-day qualifier in Brett Bodine, 12th row, Ben Hess, and Jimmy Means. Starting back in the 13th row will be Michael Waltrip and Rusty Wallace. Row number 14, Greg Sachs and Dale Jarrett. And as you look at the rest of the starting lineup, you will notice that some of the drivers who have been in contention at many times this year on the Winston Cup Trail are starting in the rear of the pack. So the cars are now on the backstretch and are warming up their tires and getting the engines up to temperature before we start this event. We have several cameras that we're going to employ for you, not only covering the racetrack, but look at this one. It is Rusty Wallace's carrying this bumper cam that shoots from the rear bumper of the car. It should provide some interesting shots for you as we go throughout the afternoon. There is the uh, look from inside Rusty's car as he's positioned behind Jimmy Beans. Jeff Bodine will also carry one of our in-car cameras in the new Lumina. He's lined up behind the Kodak car driven by Rick Wilson. And there is Harry Gant in the Skull Bandit Oldsmobile as he is positioned right behind Daryl Walter for the start of the race. The field now is moving into the trioval. 18 degrees of banking in the trioval. The turns here are banked at 33 degrees. We're about five miles an hour slower as far as qualifying speeds are concerned this year compared to last year, but nevertheless, a lot of unanswered questions as we begin this race as to how exactly it's gonna go. Will there be a lot of competition? Will we see a lot of drafting as we always have had here at Talladega? We'll stand by as the green flag has now been displayed and the Winston 500 is underway from Talladega Super Speedway. Settle back and enjoy an afternoon of racing here on ESPN. The turns are wide here at Talladega, Bob. They can run two and three abreast, and certainly we see some of that in the first lap. And one of the things you'll notice, you'll visibly notice, with the restrictor plates, the cars can't get up to speed quite as fast as they used to, but now they begin to stand on the accelerator, and coming down the back stretch, we have three abreast racing. That is Neil Bonnet in car number 21 going to the inside and taking the lead from Mark Martin, but Davey Allison battles back on the outside as the cars are in the 33-degree banking between turns three and four for the first time. It's Bonnet and Allison side by side off of turn number four and into the trioval. Look at this, folks. This is unbelievable. Side by side. Wow, what a first lap. 
They are basically in the same formation. They have changed in spots, but it's still two abreast racing. One line on the high side and one line on the low side as they battle for position. Look at how the Lumina, driven by Daryl Waltrip, is trying to get down low on the racetrack. That's the red and white number 17 car. But still side by side, Bonnet to the inside. Davy Allison to the outside. In the second row there is Mark Martin at number six and Bill Elliott at number nine. And look at the competition from Harry Gant's in-car camera. Look at how close these cars are running. And there's simply nowhere he could go if he could make a pass. He gets at the mercy of what the inside line does. And the inside line, they can't go the outside like It's just like a, car, a parade lap, side by side. Lap number two is complete. We can't determine who's leading. They are virtually deadlocked side by side as they once again go into turn number one as we watch the action from Harry Gant's in-car camera. Neil Bonnet and Davey Allison still run side by side. Mark Martin and Bill Elliott are side by side. Then behind them comes Daryl Waltrip in the new Lumina and to his outside is Morgan Shepard. Darrell Walker told me at the driver introduction that he changed one screen three times this morning. He said, I couldn't make my mind up which one I wanted in. He said, I had a fast one. He said, I'm afraid the wind was going to blow too much for it. He said, I had a slow one. He said, make the car drive good. He said, it wouldn't be fast enough. He said, I finally wound up with the intermediate one. It looks like it's working okay right now. These cars, folks, are running 195 miles an hour side by side. This is not 60 mile an hour. This is not playing. This is for real. They are faster than they qualify, and that is uh, understandable because of the drafting. And here is the bumper cam. We're looking from the rear of Rusty Wallace's car, and that is Michael Waltrip that we are looking at. There's Larry Pearson on the inside getting past. Larry sort of lost the draft of the inside cars, and he's going backwards as the others come by him on the outside. <laughs> what a shot. Never see Dale Jerry trying to get by Michael Waltrip. Michael pulls up right on the bumper of Rusty Wallace. Crystal clear picture from that bumper cam on Rusty Wallace's car. They move through the trioval once again. It's still Bonnet and Davy Allison side by side. Well, who are they giving credit? Who are they giving the Winston Cup points to? That's a very <laughs> good question, Benny, because you literally cannot tell who's leading those first three laps. They have been virtually side by side as they cross the line every time. Now we're beginning to see some of the cars get strung out a little bit as Michael Waltrip there in the yellow car is high on the racetrack and has lost one position. Meanwhile, up front, it is still two abreast racing. At the end of the backstretch, we're still seeing Neil Bonnet and Davey Allison side by side. And look at the speed, 191.138 miles an hour. This is unbelievable. You know, these big they probably won't get to use them. No one is sitting down yet. I know I haven't. Darrell Waltrip looking on the inside. Walter trying to get to the inside of Mark Martin as they head for turn number one. It's three abreast in there, and by golly, Darrell Waltrip got the job done. He now replaces Mark Martin there beside Bill Elliott. Mark Martin drops back to go alongside of Morgan Shepard. Well, that was a bold move by Darrell, but now he's going to try to go to the front. Maybe this Lumina has something that we haven't seen in qualifying. And in the practice period, look at this. It is Waltrip going to the front. Neil Bonnet drops back. And now it's Darrell Waltrip and Davey Allison wheel to wheel off the banking into the trioval. Well, let's see if Darrell now can use that inside to get by Davey Allison. Neil Bonnet couldn't do it. They just sat there and run side by side. We'll see if Waltrip can do it. Allison is going to lead this lap. Or is he? No, no. I think Walter's led the lap. I thought Allison was going to pull ahead there and lead by a half a car length, but not so. I think Walter may have gotten credit for leading that lap. Anyway, it is still side-by-side -side racing that we are seeing in the first five laps, making six laps of this Winston 500. 188 laps will comprise this race. They're on a 2.66-mile racetrack. Now Walter heading low once again down the backstretch in the number 17 car. Neil Bonnet is right behind him. Davey Allison leads the outside line with Bill Elliott and Morgan Shepard. And there's Earnhardt. Yeah, fifth he's, spot. He started 17th today. He has moved up to the fifth spot. There is the uh, brightly colored jackets worn by the Chevrolet people as they sit in the stands and cheer their new Lumina. And it leads.
Saints here at Talladega as they cross the line. Waltrip this time clearly has the lead. Waltrip is the leader, second place, a battle between Neil Bonnet and Davey Allison. Some exciting competition in the Winston 500 from Talladega Super Speedway, and we'll be back with more of our live coverage right after these messages. Money at stake this afternoon, the purse totaling $711,000, the richest ever at Talladega. We have seen two cars break away from the rest. It is Davey Allison showing the way with now Dale Earnhardt in second position. In third there, the car on the inside, the red car, number 25, is Ken Schrader. He has come from 21st starting position. And I don't think anyone expected any car in the field to be able to do that in the number of laps that we've run, which they're on the 10th lap right now. That car is strong. He had an engine problem in qualifying the first round, had to qualify the second round, was the fastest, as you mentioned when you introduced them. But he has come to the front in a hurry. That's a strong car. Remember, Ken Schrader was the lap leader at Daytona, leading 114 of the 200 laps. We're inside Harry Gant's car once again. Let's listen to the action. Well, Kenny Schrader's got a strong horse here at Talladega, but he's going to be tired a little bit. He went to Bradenton, Florida last night and won a 100 lap short track event that in Bradenton, Florida. They have problems getting back here. He finally arrived about 2 o'clock this morning back to Talladega. He only had a few hours sleep and he was a little bit sleepy this morning. But he said, hey, once that green flag drops, I'm ready because I'm going to go to the front. And I believe he predicted it correctly. Bob? All right, Jerry. Well, we're seeing him run in third position now as he is behind Dale Earnhardt and the leader of the race, Davey Allison, and just ahead of Harry Gant. They have gotten out in single file there now. That uh, will let them run faster around the racetrack. And they do a little bit better job of drafting, but it was amazing the number of laps that they ran side by side before they got Allison leads, but look at Ken Schrader to the inside of Dale Earnhardt as he tries to make a move for second position going into turn number one. Well, Harry Gant maybe is going to go with him. That could help him make the move, and he did clearly pass Dale Earnhardt. Here comes Harry Gant down on the inside. He's going to suck right up on Kenny Schrader or Izzy. Now here comes Earnhardt back up on the outside as Darrell Walter will help him. That might leave Harry Gant out to dry, as they say. We'll see as he is the only car on the inside line. He needs somebody to pass with seeing Bill Elliott and Morgan Shepard move to the high side of him. Not many friends out there right now. Harry uh, finally, I believe, finds a spot to get back in. Morgan Shepard, I think, is going to have to get back in from the fourth corner. Yes, Harry again at least got back in line, and then if Morgan Shepard had given that spot, he could have went back to about 25th or 30th in a hurry. Good have Luminas are running second, third, and fourth. The Ford of Davy Allison leads, but then the Lumina of Ken Schrader then that of Dale Earnhardt, and then Daryl Waltrip. When you look at Schrader and Daryl Waltrip and Jeff Bodine, all three of those cars are owned by Rick Hendrick, and you say, why don't those three get together? I think they had hit the nail on the head just a moment ago. There's no friends out there today. There's no teammates. It's every man for himself. Bill Elliott is in fifth position in the red and white number nine car. You see Rick Wilson on the just behind that in the yellow car, passing on the outside. Now he's got Morgan Shepard on the inside, and Paul Morgan, he needs a friend or he's going to the back. Let's go to the pit area, and Dr. Jerry Punch, who has more on the Rick Wilson run. Well, Rick Wilson's car that he has here is nicknamed Uncle Sam. It's the same car he had in Daytona last July. As we're looking out the back of Harry Gant's Skull Bandit Mount at the Rick Wilson car, it's the same car he finished 18 inches shy at Daytona last July to Bill Elliott. They nicknamed the car Uncle Sam. Why? Because it drafts so well here at Daytona and Talladega, and it's a cute little nickname for that old movie. Rick Wilson's running strong here at Talladega. Bob? All right, indeed he is. We're looking at him from out back of... Uh, Harry Gant's car. Now we go back up front and see Allison still with the lead and Earnhardt running second for a moment. A side-by-side -side battle between Ken Schrader and Darrell Waltrip for third position, but now Schrader is going to lose a position as he gets down on the inside line. Schrader was second the last time by, and he tried to make a pass for the lead and looking for it. He's now about seventh or eighth and steadily going backwards. And talk about going backwards, Benny. Pole setter Mark Martin is all the way back to 19th right now. Wow. 
Schrader needs somebody to draft with. He is going toward the rear. Let's see if he can get back up in that uh, single file formation, or perhaps somebody will join him down on the inside line. Jeff Bodine, his teammate, is right behind him. And Phil Parsons, now he does get back up into the drafting line. And I tell you what, that might have been a teammate move because it looked to me like Bodine just backed off a little bit and let Kenny Schroeder get in because Schroeder was out to dry. And I was I want to say a moment ago, as we looked from inside Jeff Bodine's car, you see those stripes on the windshield? That's metal protectors inside the car. Believe it or not, the windshield will not stand 190 miles per hour. The windshield would literally cave in were it not for those metal stra straps that we see. The lead draft passing some of the slower cars already. Grant Adcox has been lapped, and so is Charlie Baker. But again, we're inside Jeff Bodine's car, and now a battle for second position. It is Darrell Waltrip to the inside, but he has broken the draft. <laughs> well, I tell you, it is going to be a game of strategy right now, and these pit crews, as they sit there, Jack and Jerry down in the pits, the Pit crews today are going to have the ultimate test in keeping their cars up front. But we see what happens if they get behind. They just simply cannot go to the front that easily. So many people criticize NASCAR for running these restrictor plates and slowing the cars down. But I'll tell you what, I think it kind of puts back into racing the mentality that you have to have to drive a racetrack like this. I agree with you, Bob. I think that and put strategy back into it. Here now is Ken Schrader down on the inside. He might be able to help walk a little bit as they try to work their way back to the front after each of them got down on the inside. We see Rusty Wallace coming into the picture. Rusty started back in 26th position, and now he is up there in uh, the top 10. to count how many cars are in the lead draft. I think there's about 20. The average speed of the race, 187 miles an hour. Better than the record. There is Waltrip and teammate Ken Schrader on the inside line. And now Davey Allison has also dropped to the inside line. But he remember, here comes Waltrip and Schrader also on that inside line. And uh, Dick Trickle is also there inside. Davey Allison, I thought he might have a problem because certainly he would not just have driven down to the inside but he's caught down there right now and that outside is going to move away but here comes Waltrip and Schrader up behind him so he might be their saving grace. I think the problem he had is a black number three. Yeah. Earnhardt with the lead. Nope not anymore. Davey Allison recaptures first position. Here comes Waltrip right behind him and Ken Schrader is also there. You are seeing a lesson in drafting at Talladega. You know, it's unbelievable just how much the slipstream will do for these cars. It's six, seven miles an hour at least by running together rather than being uh, hung out to dry like Ken Schrader is right now. Please let me in, somebody, he says. Dick Trickle is right there behind him in the number 84 Miller High Life car. There's the story right there. Davey Allison leads. Daryl Walter running second. Dale Earnhardt is third as we are 18 laps into the 188-lap Winston 500. 20 of 188 laps, and the leader is Davey Allison. Second place, Daryl Waltrip. Harry Gant is third, then Ken Schrader and Dale Earnhardt. There are 20 cars, we got 21 cars in the lead draft, more than half the field still running nose to tail. Now, a lot Allison, of jockey going on. Beginning to pass some of the slower traffic. Ben, aren't you surprised how low these cars are running on the racetrack? And it's Daryl Waltrip and, and Davey Allison both are right on the bottom of the racetrack. Yeah, you would think that with the restriction plate and down a little bit of more tire that they would run as high as they could to keep the RPMs up in the turns. But one thing that does show, look at Daryl Waltrip, how low he is on the racetrack. And that's a characteristic of Daryl, though he likes to run down there. But that also is a characteristic of a good handling race car that will stay down there. And apparently it's not hurting him as far as speed is concerned, maybe even helping him. Daryl Waltrip has won twice as many races as any other active driver here at Talladega. He has won four times on this racetrack. And of course, he would love to win today. One thing he would do is give him a $100 bonus, $100,000 bonus from Winston. Since he won the Daytona 500, put him in position for the Winston Million by winning three of four of the major races this year. Running in fifth spot is Dick Trickle. We've been talking about how well he has performed all year, but basically on the short tracks. There were some real questions, I think, about how he would perform on the
the super speedway. Well, that tells a story right there. He is right up in there, fifth position, right behind Ken Schrader, and this is his first appearance on this racetrack. Dick Trickle from Wisconsin Rapids, Wisconsin. Bob, another driver that started in third position, Neil Bonnet. We saw him lead the race there early. He has lost the lead draft and is all the way back to the 25th position. Now Waltrip begins to challenge Davey Allison once again as we are seeing Waltrip go to the low side of the racetrack. There's a look at the leader, Davey Allison, and there is second place, Daryl Waltrip. Schrader and Harry Gant now begin to battle side by side for third place. And here comes Gant on the inside. Well, he tried that a little earlier and sort of got hung down there. Morgan Shepard led him back in, and he's hung down there again. Let's see if anybody let him in this time. I don't think he's going to find a friend as easily as he did. Ooh, okay. Just a little nudge there to Labonte. That's the way to make a hole for yourself. Yeah, that made a pretty big hole there, didn't it? <laughs> we can put a greyhound in there. <laughs> Gant has gone into fourth. That's Terry Labonte running fifth and then Dick Trickle. Neil Bonnet, you spoke of him a few minutes ago, Ned, and there he is. He started third and currently runs 24th and at, can be contributed only to the fact that he simply got out of the draft. Let's go to Jerry Punch for a comment on Neil. Well, Bob, that's correct in one part. He did get out of the draft and lose the lead draft, but he has a problem with the car. Apparently what Leonard Wood and the crew are telling me is that they have a miss or a little bit of a skip in the motor on that Sitco Ford, so that car has lost some time. Now, the miss seems to be clearing up a little bit, but the car is very, very loose. They're getting very little air on that rear spoiler to keep the car in the draft, so he's having to be very careful how he drafts up behind cars, and when he has the car on his rear deck, like the Derek Coke car currently following here in the draft, it makes his car even looser, so they're going to try to get the car in on the first caution flag, change tires, and tighten it down a little bit. Bob? All right, this is the second pack that we're looking at. This group of seven cars running together, but they are almost a full straightaway, a full backstretch at least, behind the lead draft. And this uh, contingent being led by Kyle Petty in car number 42. Ricky Rudd is also right there in 26. Then comes Bonnet in the 21 car. Behind him is the number 10 car, Derry Coke, and then Greg Sachs. Back to the leaders, meanwhile, it is Davey Allison continuing to lead the Winston 500. He started outside of row number one and has been leading most of the laps since the drop of the green. That's Waltrip in second, Ken Schrader in third, and Harry Gant runs fourth. And Dale Earnhardt is falling back. He was up there among that front group of, a little while ago, but now he's on the inside going into turn three, so he has dropped back to about the 18th or 20th position. There he is. The 21 cars in this lead draft, and there are three behind him, so that means he is running in the 18th position. It looks like Earnhardt has a problem. I'm not sure whether or not he has a problem. Not Jack Root can tell us. Well, Benny, Benny, let's tell you what the problem is. These are brand new Luminas, and both Daryl Waltrip and Dale Earnhardt went to the front, as you saw, and then they backed off. Well, the wind is gusting quite badly here in Talladega, and they began to buffet the cars around, and they were afraid maybe that they had a problem with the car. And until they could bring the cars on a pit road and check to see if there's any rubbing or not, both Jeff Hammond, the crew chief for Daryl Waltrip, and Richard Childress and Kirk Shelmerdine, who called the shots for Dale Earnhardt, have said, back out of the throttle just a little bit, ride the draft, and we'll see what happens on the first pit stop. And when you talk about Waltrip and Earnhardt, another interesting factor, you know the numbers game that Waltrip talks about? 17 is 17 and 17. Well, the Earnhardt crew came up with something. They qualified 17th, and look at this. They're pitting in pit number 17. They say that might be a Talladega omen for them. And it was 17 years ago that Darrell Waltrip made his debut in Winston Cup Racing right here at the Talladega Super Speedway. So the numbers, uh, if you believe in them, they're in Darrell Waltrip's favor. It's a numbers game that we play on the racetrack as far as numbers concerning speed. It's 191.904, the last lap for Davey Allison, the leader. I tell you what, Ned, I don't believe in numbers as much as I do as in names. Kenny Bingham and Ronnie Redden. <laughs> VNR engine in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. They are the fellas that build the engines for the 17 and the 25. They ran Daytona engines for VNR. Daytona 500 and had the fastest car there in Schrader. As we saw Schrader go by, he's trying Ooh. second. Can he get by? Yes, he's by. Darrell has to take the escape road to the high side, but Ken Schrader has taken over second place. Darrell Waltrip back to third, and now Dick Trickle and Terry Labonte battle side by side for fourth. Trickle has used this low line 
on several occasions through the trioval here and the beginning to fall back a little bit now but it seems to have worked for him on a couple of occasions i noticed yesterday at the last practice session that he was able to pull down on the inside coming off of a corner and uh, either pass a car or or certainly stay with them but when you have this many cars running together and you get down on that inside now he finds him a hole to get back in there it can be tough on so nick trickle is in seventh position now we have run green all the way. The first 28 laps, a tremendous pace being set by the leader, Davey Allison. We'll be back after this. I'm Jenkins, Ned Jarrett, Benny Parsons, Jack Arood, and Dr. Jerry Punch back at Talladega Super Speedway, where Davey Allison is in the lead. There you can see his finishes on the Super Speedways. He had the lead over Ken Schrader and Daryl Waltrip. Then comes Terry Labonte in fourth place, and then Bill Elliott as the leaders begin to move in on some of the slower traffic. Dave Marcus is on the inside and being lapped by the uh, those up front. There are now 19 cars in the lead draft as Phil Markle and Dale Earnhardt have bro both broken away from it, actually fallen behind it. There's the average speed, 189.623 more than three miles an hour faster than the race record. Let's hope we can keep up this pace all the way through and we will not have to uh, interrupt the flow or for any caution periods. Well, there's some guys out there right now that would love to see a caution flag because they're just simply... Uh, Dale Earnhardt is a classic example. He is, as you mentioned just a moment ago, at the back of the, this lead ramp. He needs a caution flag to get back up there and to adjust his car as well. I was hoping maybe this lead draft would be able to use some of these slow cars and some of the guys that we've been trying to. A.J. Foyt is in 11th position. He spent most of the weekend in Louisville for the Kentucky Derby, arriving back here late yesterday afternoon for a very few number of practice laps in the final practice session. But he is ready to race today. And A.J. Foyt, who began this race from the 11th starting position, is still in that spot. I'll tell you, that's quite an accomplishment that he didn't get to practice in the car after he qualified he hopped on an airplane i guess his own airplane and, and went back to louisville and there's rusty wallace running behind aj Foyt as we watch out the windshield of rusty wallace but uh harry gant took the aj car Foyt car out for just a few laps of practice yesterday but i don't think he ever got it up to speed jerry punch can entertain us with a story concerning aj Foyt. To Kentucky yesterday for the Kentucky Derby. He had a horse that he raised that does breed thoroughbreds. He had a horse that ran in one of the preliminary races up there called Crimson Memory. And I asked AJ before the race, he was getting in the car, he chuckled and said, I said, how'd the horse run yesterday? He said, like a mule all day long. He said, the thing barely, I think the thing went the opposite way out of the gate. He said, but I hope I run a whole lot better today. He said, I'm going to try to hang with these leaders for most of the afternoon. Uh, the Copenhagen Oldsmobile is not running like a mule at the moment in the lead draft. Here is the action in front of Boyd. As we see now, Daryl Waltrip in that third position, but he has dropped back a little from the front two, namely Kent Schrader and the leader, Davey Allison. Here is Gant working the inside line again. He's not making the headway down there. Right behind him, we see Jeff Bodine in the bright yellow car trying to get by Rick Wilson, and he made the pass going down in turn one. From inside Jeff's car. so easy, doesn't it, Ned? Yeah, it does look so easy, but it's not easy. Now we look at Bodine from out the back class of the Harry Gant car. Ooh, look at Bodine close, close right up on Harry on the outside. He's got position. Does Harry know he's there? That's the question. Bodine's got it. Dale Earnhardt. Talk about being hung out to dry. He is indeed hung out to dry, running by himself. What's the update on him, Jack? 
they're very concerned about the car, as we alluded to before, they thought it might be just the wind kicking up, but now they're starting to check the stagger on the tires and making some changes on pit road in terms of tire, tire stagger because of the fact they feel that it could have been a poor choice of tires as well. But what they've done is radioed back and forth to Dale and just said, look, we know, but you've got to just hang on because track positioning is so very important here. We can't pull you onto pit road. All right, should we continue under green, gentlemen? Where can, when can we expect the first uh, set of pit stops? I think they're going to pit somewhere between laps 40 and 45. That's over 100 miles, but they can go more than 100 miles on a tank of fuel with the restrictor plate. So some of them might even stretch it up to over 40 miles. And one thing that's going to happen today is when those front cars start going into the pits and making their pit stop, as we see Morgan Shepard down on the inside of Bodine, when those front leaders start making their pit stop, the other fellows are going to go in the pits as well because they just simply cannot afford to be caught on the racetrack without someone to draft with. And they hope that the other pit crew makes as good a pit stop as they do. That's one time they're pulling four other pit crews to make a good pit stop. Morgan Shepard, the number 75 car, now runs behind Harry Gann as Morgan got himself low on the racetrack but decided to blend back up into the drafting line. Talking about fuel mileage, remember that at Daytona, Darrell Walter ran the last 132 and a half miles on a tank of fuel. That equals out to 53 laps. We're glad you could join us on this Sunday afternoon for the Winston 500 at the world's fastest speedway, Talladega. The yellow is out, and Pit Road is a very busy place as virtually everyone has come in for their pit stop. And look at how Michael Waltrip is getting his tires changed. That car should not be in that uh, particular. And there is the reason why we are under caution. Dale Jarrett has made contact with the wall coming out of turn number four. The word is that he is okay, and also the word is that he cut a tire. Dale has had uh, a lot of tough luck so far this year. He just can't seem to get things going. He was running uh, in the 16th position at Charlie 28 and had uh, stayed in the lead draft until just the last couple laps. Hardy's team looking for the color combination that they like. Remember the last race they had a different paint job with a dark blue and orange. And this time the uh, the paint scheme is uh, white and orange. And the uh, 94 car is being pushed out of the pit area by the Kodak crew of Rick Wilson. But now they decided, well, you're on your own now. <laughs> we pushed as far as we're going to push. And uh, Sterling Marlin still can't get that car fired. So Marlin sits along pit road. The car just moving very slightly. Now he comes to a complete stop. Don't know what could be the problem with that car. Here comes the Kodak crew once again. Now he gets the thing fired again and begins to move away. Boy, that's an ancient moment for a driver. He knows that the leaders are going to be coming around. He says, please, don't let me go to the lap down. He had already lost a lot of track position, but now he just wants to stay in the lead lap. So lap number 39, and the caution is out on Talladega Super Speedway. Darryl, Dale Jarrett with an incident up in turn number four, but he's okay, and we'll be right back down into the pit area. And Alan Kowicki has uh, positioned his Xerox board in the pit area, and the hood is up. Yes, I don't know. He was uh, running in that lead draft, Bob. But apparently he has some grip. We'll take a look at the crew cam, who is on the front, front, right front tire changer of Darrell Walter's car. That's Eddie Dickerson. around to the left side of the car now. Looked like they had a bit of a problem there on the right uh, front tire. One of the lugs apparently didn't start. He had to start it with his finger, and that took him an extra second or so. He missed one of the lug nuts, and he had to start one of them with his hand. Uh, and it's amazing, just that little bit makes a big difference. Jerry punches in the pits. Well, gentlemen, pretty routine pit stops up here. I'm in the Mark Martin pit. They had a lot of problem getting the car to handle. They were going to come in, and as most cars wanted to do, change only two tires to, to maintain track position. The only major change up here was the Neil Bonnet pit was just pitting right beside the Mark Martin pit. Neil Bonnet went from Goodyear to Hoosier. Therefore, he had to change four tires to try to tighten the car down. 
But a big problem here in the pits was a stop-and-go penalty. After the cars Lexington at pit road, they went above the white line, and they were black flagged and brought back in. Among those, Jeff Bodine, Bill Elliott, Mark Martin, and Phil Barkdahl all had to come back in for a stop-and-go, which put them at the rear of the field and cost them a lot of track position. Let's go up pit road to Jackaroo. Yeah. Well, Jerry, another victim of that stop-and-go situation, which was all well, the drivers were, were warned about it. There's a white line down in the, in the uh, turns. They can't go up across that line. Davey Allison, who came in and took on right side tires and had great track positioning and would have held on to the lead on the restart, he had to come back down because the NASCAR officials told him he was going to be issued a stop and go penalty. So he changed the tires on the left side. So the front runners in our area have all decided to change left sides and right sides, four tires all the way around. And Alan Kowicki has come in for his stop and go because he violated what is now being called the blend line as well. Now, the problem that he had when he was down here for so long during the caution was they had a miss in the engine, so they changed a couple of the spark plugs and then sent him back out. But the problem lies in the white line down in the corners. That's where the drivers are pulling up behind the pace car and they're making a track violation. And that's where we're seeing Alan Kowicki this time. He's staying down there. And they were told in the driver's meeting, you got to stay below that white line until you get off of turn two and head down the backstretch. Next time around, we'll be going back to racing. Field between turns three and four, and the leader is Rusty Wallace. And Bob, what we said at the top of the show, we had seen several cars get left, including Bobby Hillen and Larry Pearson, Ben Hess, several others. They got their lap back because the leaders went into the pits. They came on down, across that start-finish line, and uh, got a lap back. Rusty Wallace leads him down to the line. We uh, saw the bumper cam there just momentarily, looking back on the second-place car of Darrell Waltrip. They move through the trioval. Now remember, they're not yet to the line. It's located way down toward turn number one. There it is. And the green flag flies, and we are now back to racing as we look at the bubble can from Rusty Wallace's car. Look at the start that Darrell Walter got on the restart. Has the lead easily coming off the second corner. Rusty in second place and Schrader in third. He just motored right around Rusty Wallace when the green came out. Now we're seeing some jockeying for position as they go down the back stretch. Two and three wide as Schrader moves to second in the Lumina. And a three abreast race. And there's the bumper cam now looking back on Harry Gant. See Schrader down on the inside of him. Here comes A.J. Boyd up on the outside. Ernie Urban there. So is Hutt Strickland in car 57. Oh, look at how close they come out there. Man. Man, what great shots this is. Foyt in the Copenhagen Oldsmobile. Look how close he moves up on Rusty Wallace. That can't be more than, well, inches. It is very, very close. Of course, he knows he needs to be that close to do an effective job of drafting because Darrell Waltrip, Ken Schrader, and Morgan Shepard are about to get away from him. Just an unbelievable picture from that from that uh, bumper cam. Look at how crisp and clear that picture is. And look how close he gets. He's going to bump him. Oh. Don't knock our camera out, AJ. Unbelievable. Well, he backed off. He must have heard me. He said, <laughs> okay, I don't want to mess up that camera. But you know something here, right? The first three cars look like they might be able to AJ once again pull it right on the back of Rusty Wallace. On the outside, on the inside. Oh man, at speeds probably close to, if not a little over 190 miles an hour. Three cars, meanwhile, seem to be breaking away from the lead draft. There they are. Yeah, they had pulled farther away than they are right now. You see that second group of cars coming on now. They were farther ahead, but that good drafting that A.J. Foyt is doing on Rusty Wallace is helping them to catch these three cars, which Ken Schrader now is in the lead, Morgan Shepard second, and Darrell Walker third. There are still 34 cars on the lead lap with 44 laps gone. And about a half a dozen of those have gone a lap down, but as we mentioned, got a lap back during that call period. And now we are indeed seeing Rusty Wallace and A.J. Boyd and the others moving up, closing in. There's Michael Waltrip, also Harry Gant. This is the second pack. That's Gant, Waltrip, Brett Bodine, Neil Bonnet also in that group, Davey Allison. Now, Davey Allison, as was mentioned, was one of those drivers that had the stop-and-go penalty, so he was all the way at the back. He was in front when he went into the pits. 
that little miscue coming out or just uh, forgot the rule that they were very vivid about in the driver's meeting. They were very emphatic about that. Said, we will penalize you. So we've seen that they will. Well, there have been many violations of that rule on the racetracks that we have televised from this year. NASCAR taking a strong stand about the cars blending into traffic after they exit the pits. Well, we were standing here watching practice from our booth yesterday afternoon, and we saw a couple of cars come out of the pits at slow speeds and went up into the lower groove right where they're going into turn one there now. And there were some cars that were up to full speed came around, and they almost had a wreck. And NASCAR pointed that out to them and said, we will not have any of that today in the race. Five cars now are in the lead draft. Ken Schrader, Morgan Shepard, Darrell Waltrip, then A.J. Foyt. In fourth of the fifth place car is Terry Labonte. Aerodynamically speaking, drag means less speed but more stability. Drag regulated by the rear spoiler on a Winston Cup car explained in this trackback. NASCAR came up with a new rule at Daytona this year regarding the rear deck spoiler. A lot of the cars were qualifying with a spoiler straight back and even some were trying to race with maybe five or ten degrees of spoiler angle. Now what that does when you lay that spoiler down like that, it gives the car a lot of straightaway speed, but it makes it very unstable in the turns. There's no down pressure on the rear tires causing the cars to try and slide the rear end. So NASCAR came up with a rule requiring a minimum of 20 degrees of spoiler angle. Now that, that's for safety really because there was a lot of accidents and a lot of spin outs in practice and qualifying at Daytona. But you'll see some of the cars on some of the shorter tracks racing with as much as 40, 50, and 60 degrees of spoiler angle, depending on how much rear downforce they need on their rear tires. A new restrictor plate, a new spoiler reel, and the new Lumina, all in action here at the Winston 500 in Talladega. 188 laps completed. Ken Schrader leads. Morgan Shepard runs second. Darrell Waltrip is third. Dick Trickle fourth. And look at this. Dale Earnhardt, who was all hung out to dry about 10 minutes ago, has caught the lead draft again and is in fifth position. And as a matter of fact, Dale has now moved into fourth position, passing Harry Gant. And now Gant and Dick Trickle race side by side with Terry Labonte there at number 11. I think Earnhardt's car got so loose he couldn't drive it, especially in the draft of the among other cars and he just had to back off and now they that they've made a pit stop they got the tires the stagger they want on them and tighten the car up a little bit and here he is right back up front trickle using the inside line again racing with harry gant certainly an impressive performance though and look at earnhardt go to third well he just drove by darrell walton on the outside like he wasn't there Whatever was wrong with that car isn't now, huh? I thought Daryl had blown up when Earnhardt drove by so fast, and I'm not sure that it isn't. <laughs> well, certainly the most impressive story so far, Ken Schrader coming from 21st starting position. He now leads the race, and Jack Arood is in his pit. And Bob, I'm with Dennis Connor, and Dennis, you guys didn't get a chance to practice down here at Talladega because you didn't have a car ready. Yeah. We went through some uh, sort of bad experiences in the past several weeks, and we just haven't had time to get the car completed in time to come down here and test, so we had to do the next best thing, go to Daytona. And I'm not sure that wasn't uh, a good good move because we had just left from Daytona with the Monte Carlo, and we sort of knew what it, it was going to do down there. So Now, some of the people here watching this say that the Luminas have been sandbagging and qualifying because they're running quite well in the race. What's your version? Well, the only thing I can tell you is us personally, we weren't sandbagging. We did what we could. Uh, we had a problem in the first round, and when we come back and we're fortunate enough to have the weather clear up and get a chance, we did the best we could. Well, Harry Gant has presented himself on pit road, but for more action down that end, let's go to Jerry Punch. He's with the crew chief. Well, I'm with Butch Mock, who's the co-owner co of the Morgan Shepard car, along with Bob Rahilly. And Butch, your car running very, very well, but you guys are thinking about changing tire brands. Why? Well, the car's running real good right now, and uh, been in contact with Morgan. He said the track's just a little bit greasy today, and uh, we tried the Hoosiers yesterday afternoon in practice, and the car seemed like it stuck a little bit better. Uh, we weren't quite as quick on the Hoosiers, but maybe for today's race, we're looking at changing tires. Well, a lot of drivers, a lot of crew members looking at the Neil Bonnet car. He did change the Hoosiers last time in. The car had been very, very loose, and the Hoosiers will grip the track a little more, but the problem is, now, remember, the Hoosier tire is two inches smaller than the Goodyear tire. You will see a lot more RPMs here that will push it up over 7,000 RPM and enable
he'd be awfully tough on the engine. Maybe Benny Parsons or Ned Jarrett could come in. Fellas, uh, can an engine stand all day long at that much RPM? Well, Jerry, they don't turn that many RPMs with the restrictor plates anyway. It should not affect the valve train, which is normally the, the thing that RPMs affect the most. So it might shoot them up another couple hundred RPM. It just might get them past the the horsepower level because the horsepower level with the restrictor plate is several hundred RPMs lower than it is without the restrictor plate. Well, they had the problem. Goodyear came here with a tire they thought would work well if it was extremely warm, which it normally is at Talladega, but it's unseasonably cool today. So the hard tire that Goodyear brought is really just not gripping the track like they wanted to. So the cars are very, very loose. Now the Hoosier tires are considerably softer and they will grip the track. That's why possibly Morgan Shepard, we've already seen Neil Bond and maybe others, will make the move to the Hoosier tires. Let's go up to the Harry Gant pit and Jack Aroo. Jack? Well, Jerry, they've elected to stay with Goodyear tires, but the reason Harry had to come out of pit road for an unscheduled pit stop is he cut one of those hard tires down. So that was costly for him, not only in terms of track positioning, but also getting out of the sequence when it comes time to make your normal pit stops. So a report from uh, the pit area on what's going on down there, but the action is hot and heavy on the racetrack. Not too much for Daryl Waltrip as his car continues to slide backward. Perhaps a rear spoiler problem on that car. Well, they think they might have bumped it up a little bit too much. He might have uh, said, hey, it was loose before they made that pit stop, and certainly that will slow you down and make the car more stable in the turn, but it will slow you down. Let me say that Harry Gant did not lose a lap during his car unscheduled pit stop he's about uh, probably eight or ten seconds in front of the leaders now but he's running by himself and there are the seven cars that are on the lead draft led by Ken Schrader right behind Morgan Shepard and a little bit of racetrack back to the third place car of Dale Earnhardt well and then Davey Allison is up in that crew and remember he's one of those drivers that was penalized that stop and go penalty so he has come from the rear back up to the front and that means his car is very strong. Here's Eddie Beerswall in the Auto Finder's car that apparently having a problem coasting into the pits. I don't know if he's going to make it or not. He's going awfully slow at that point on the racetrack. If the car should stall, that means that the caution flag will wave. Car just barely moving. You can see how close he is to the entrance to pit road. And is he going to make it? I believe he is going to make the entrance, in which case the yellow would not come out. We'll continue to watch that situation. Now let's go to Jack Aroot, who has an update on the Daryl Waltrip situation with Jeff Hammond. Well, gentlemen, your supposition was absolutely correct. You went the wrong way with the spoiler. A little bit too much, Jeff Hammond, for Daryl Waltrip. Yeah, it seemed like it's, it's really hurt the car. We only went up us a little bit, but uh, the car is real sensitive and real spoiler. We knew that earlier, so we'll just have to uh, work on it a little bit and uh, get it back like it was and readjust the chassis rather than the rear spoiler. How sensitive it may be. Well, we're talking about maybe three to four degrees make a lot of difference in this car, and it's pretty evident on the racetrack right now. Well, he's making a fine run from the front to the back right now, and these guys are really open for a caution. Daryl Waltrip has slid back to 15th position because the spoiler is perhaps three to four degrees higher than it was a few laps ago, but he's beginning to catch up now with some of the uh, others in front of him. Waltrip using the low line. That's Terry Lamonti there in front of him. And there is the leader as Dale Earnhardt now begins to slip back a little as Davy Allison has taken over that third position. So it's still Schrader and Morgan Shepard, then Davy Allison, and then Dale Earnhardt. Rick Wilson, Dick Trickle, and Mark Martin are also running in this group of seven. We're live at Talladega Super Speedway in Alabama for the Winston 500, and we'll be back after this. At Talladega, there are the first three cars, Ken Schrader, Morgan Shepard, and Davey Allison. Coming along now is Dale Earnhardt in the black number three. Behind him is Rick Wilson in the yellow car number four, but these three have pulled away just a little bit. Here comes Shepard. Maybe he's going to make a move here for the lead on Ken Schrader. Did yes, he him, does. Did you see him motion to 28 car Davey Allison? said, I'm going. Come on if you want to go. <laughs> and Davey said, okay, think I'll go with you. Now I can go. So Schrader drops from first to third in just a matter of feet. He becomes our seventh leader of the race in the first 60 laps. Morgan Shepard who has only one top 10 finish in Winston Cup competition this year. That was at Atlanta. But the car has been running well all weekend. He qualified 
good enough for the sixth starting position and now is the leader. And look at him pull away a little bit. Wow, that's the biggest lead anyone's had all day. Jerry Punch can offer us more on the Morgan Shepherd story. Well, normally when you come to a racetrack, you qualify with one motor, a motor that's built primarily to run maybe a half a dozen or so laps in qualifying. You take that motor out and you put a race motor in that's considerably weaker. But Morgan said the qualifying motor felt so good and they felt so comfortable with their engine builder, Bob Hilly, that the motor would run all day. They decided to leave it in, take a gamble. Morgan said, I'm going to punish this thing. I'm going to hold my foot on the floor all day long here at Talladega. And if it'll live, we'll win it. And I think Morgan may be true to his word, gentlemen. I think you may be right. He is certainly strong at the moment, leading Allison and the others through the trioval once again. His best finisher at Talladega was fifth in the 1982 Winston 500. Morgan Shepard from Conover, North Carolina, in the Valvoline Pontiac. He thought he had a shot at the pole. He was running very good in practice, but for the fans that might not realize that on Thursday, the normal hit looks like Davey Allison's going to try to make a fast kid. Didn't have to. But uh, on Thursday afternoon, the first day of qualifying, they only got 12 cars qualified when rain moved in. Then they came in at 8 o'clock the next morning and finished qualifying all of the cars. The circumstances were different then. The track was slower, the air was thicker and heavier, and uh, those which ran that day just didn't run as fast as they did in practice. So that negated his opportunity to win the hole. But he said, I got a car that can run up front of about all he's proven here right now. There's Rick Wilson, Mark Martin, and Dick Trickle running at the back of this pack. Of course, Mark Martin was the pole sitter. Dropped back considerably before we had that yellow flag by uh, caused by the Dale Jarrett accident up in turn number four. And now Martin is right back up there with the leaders. I tell you what, we talked about Darrell Walsh running on the bottom of the racetrack earlier on in the show. Did you see Morgan Shepard that time? He literally goes almost to the apron of the racetrack going through one and two. Car is really adhering to the bottom of the racetrack like it's just very, very good race car so far. And then his last lap was over 191 miles an hour. We go inside Rusty Wallace's car. Now, watch the foot of Rusty Wallace. Look how he literally is trying to shove his foot through the firewall, and he has it that way all the way around the track. What a classic shot of him just trying to, he said, hey, I can't be on the floor. Let me move my foot just a little <laughs> bit, find some more accelerator. Rusty, buddy, there ain't no more there. Rusty Wallace is 12. Just look at the foot planted right there. Never thinks about lifting off. The only thing that's the tough on your leg muscles when you when you sit there for that long and, and hold it down. But you see, he gave a hand signal to someone there. So Rusty Wallace, we asked him earlier in the weekend what we can watch for as you carry the in-car camera for us in this race. I think what you're going to see, I, you'll, you'll very seldom see me get out of line, try to do anything by myself. I'll have to always have help. If I pull out, I'm going to have to make doggone sure that I trust the guy behind me, that the guy behind me will pull out with me and help push me along. And you're going to see a lot of hand signals. Stay in line. Come on, let's do it now. Whoa, we've got an accident coming. Stop, we've got a bad, bad accident. Uh, you'll see a lot of things like that. Uh, you'll see probably an effortless drive. Uh, driving in the corner, turn going in, back. You don't see a lot of back steering, slide and smoke like happens in Charlotte and Michigan and places like that when I'm running. Uh, you hear a lot of people at home are probably saying, boy, he doesn't take much effort to drive that. Believe me, there's a lot going on out there. It just doesn't look like it. On a speedway, a driver doesn't get out of shape much. His hands are straight ahead, turn to the left a little bit, and uh, that's what's going to happen. Those are some of the things to look for. And we're enjoying the ride with Rusty Wallace, and while he was explaining how to do it, he passed A.J. Foyt and is now 11. Morgan Shepard has a problem. He's went from the front back to the back of that fielder, back to about eighth or ninth spot, and looks like he may even, may even going to drop back some more. You don't even see him in this line, and here is a replay. He's leading right here, but watch what happens. He goes very high in the turn. Davy Allison, Ken Schrader move by in the 28-25 car. Here's Darrell Earnhardt, Rick Wilson. And now we go back to uh, live action and we have a battle for the lead with Ken Schrader on the inside of Davey Allison and Schrader goes for it. You see, these two cars are at the mercy of Dale Earnhardt. He is going to dictate who comes out of this in front. Now he's chosen Davey Allison. That means that Schrader is in trouble unless Schrader can catch Harry again. In that case, maybe he's got a chance. But Earnhardt has chosen Davey Allison. Let's see how it works out. 
Well, he's going to push Dega right up to the front, and here is Morgan Shepard in the pits. Let's go to Jerry Punch. Well, Morgan Radio Dana told him he thinks he has a flat tire. They're not sure which one, so here's Talladega. You cannot afford to take a chance and destroy a, a race car and hurt your driver. They must change four tires. It will cost them a lot of time here under green flag conditions. They have changed the right side. They will scamper around and put another two Goodyear Eagles on the left side. Tough break to Morgan Shepard and the Valvoline Pontiac. He'll go left down, Jerry, and uh, we were watching that lead group a moment ago. They were coming up on Harry Gant, who also had made an unscheduled pit stop, as we see Morgan Shepard come out of the pits, and here we see Harry Gant, the green car, number 33, down on the inside, about to go a lap down. And Ken Schrader, look, one, two, three, four, five, sixth place, and just the last lap, he was trying to take the lead from Baby Allison. Now we're watching for Morgan Shepard. There is Morgan Shepard down on the inside, staying below that blend line, and we'll be seeing the leaders here pass by him in just a few moments. Schrader still on the inside. Now he approaches the backstretch. There he is coming out of the second turn, low on the backstretch, and watch the leaders sail by. Yeah, he just simply couldn't get his speed up that quick. It takes more than a lap here to get your full speed up with the carburetor restriction. Harry Gant refuses to give up the lap, but now he may have to do so as Allison and Dave Dale Earnhardt are on the high side of Harry Gann. But here's Schrader on the inside. He said, okay, I'm going to get some of those spots back, and I got me a partner to dance with. This time, old Harry Gann. He's a nice guy. He'll take me right to the front. Let's see if he will. Dick Trickle is there also on the inside draft. Look at the serial on Davey Allison. Second at the stop, uh, start of the race. He was first at the end of 20 laps, dropped way back to 21st at the end of 40. He was 13th, beginning to move back up at the end of 50 laps, and now he has positioned himself in the lead once again. Of course, that was not a bad pit stop to put him before the position. Again, he was penalized for not staying down below that white line that we've talked about when he went out of the pits. Schrader's moved from sixth all the way up to second spot as we look right now, so at least he's using Harry Gant to get up front. Well, Gant has a very fast race car. He was running with that pack before he made his unscheduled pit stop for a change of right side tires, and now he might be able to help Ken Schrader go back to it. We're only 69 laps into this race. There are 188. There's going to be a lot more of this type of action coming up. We hope you'll stay with us for the Winston 500. We'll return after this. Welcome back to NASCAR Racing and the Winston 500 from Talladega Super Speedway in Alabama. Super Racing is what we have had in the first 72 laps of this 188 lap affair. And everything is being led at the moment by Davey Allison. Now that's Harry Gant at number 33 running second in line, but he's not the second place car and neither is Morgan Shepard. Now Morgan Shepard, when he came out of the pit, they blew by and we saw it. He got about three or four seconds behind the front pack. He got in front of the second pack, has pulled the second pack all the way up here, has left them now and has caught Davey Allison. Now Morgan Shepard is strong here, folks. Trying to get a lap back. There is Mark Martin at number six, who has moved up to second position. And that was their pole sitter. He's the guy that has a chance to pick up a bonus of $53,200. The only guy, as a matter of fact, that has the opportunity to win that kind of money. That money from Unical goes to the, the winner of the race if he is the pole sitter. There is Dale Earnhardt and Ken Schrader. And the two well, Earnhardt's car certainly is working much better now than it did earlier in the race. And here we can see that group of cars that were running back behind to those front six cars. A.J. Foyt had dropped out of that lead pack. So had Jeff Bodine in the yellow car, number five. He has caught up to them. And now, we, instead of having six cars running up front, we got about a dozen cars that are in the lead draft. And at the end of that, in fact, pretty far back is Darrell Waltrip. Here's Ken Schrader trying to make a move on the inside of Dale Earnhardt. That's Dick Trickle down on the inside, the car number 84. Ken Schrader do it down on the inside by himself without some help. Earnhardt's still out there. And here's Trickle now moving up to the outside in front of Jeff Bodine. And he's going to try to help Earnhardt. He doesn't know which way to go. He's coming back on the inside now. He just doesn't know which one of those cars to follow. Oh, this is so funny. Oh, Dick, you know, this is just too much for anybody's mind this early on in the race. You know, he don't have any idea who to follow, who's got the fastest car. He wants to pass somebody, Bob. <laughs> I 
still continue to be amazed at what he has done taking over for Mike Alexander in that car. He has just been so strong on every racetrack that we have seen him this year, including Talladega. Oh, look how close Earnhardt and Schrader get. Wow, they are close. So very, very close in the corner. Those cars hit. Oh, look at Bodan working on that steering wheel just a little bit. Looks like the car got loose for just a moment. Well, he's got Rusty Wallace right on his rear bumper. And uh, Earnhardt right in front of him. Look how. Look at Trickle. Oh, he makes it three wide. Going, going down the back stretch. He's going to have to back up because yeah, Richard work. Petty is right there. Yeah, that would work. That's it. Ooh, Dick, you aren't supposed to do that at Talladega. Don't, oh, he don't know any better, does he? Got... Here is Rusty Wallace's bumper cam again. There's Richard Petty going a lap down. Richard was running out there by himself for the last 10 or so laps. He just simply couldn't get anybody to draft with and got a lap down. Got a good indication there as before Ken Schrader passed on the front end on these new luminals. There is the front end on the Oldsmobile. <laughs> this camera, full camera, hasn't seen anybody from less than six feet all day, has he? I'm telling you. Davey Allison leads. Let's go to Jack Aroon, who has a comment on Allison. Well, guys, you've talked all day how important it is to have a dance partner at the Talladega Ho down here. Well, Davey Allison's crew, led by Robert Yates, has dispatched one of their crew members down to Morgan Shepard's pit and said, if you guys will radio to your driver for him to stay hooked up with the leader, we'll give you your lap back when the next caution comes out. So they're trying to do some high-speed poker down here right now. I'm not sure that's smart because Morgan Shepard is too fast. I don't think I'd want that guy back in the lead lap if I could help it. Well, let's go back a few laps ago and show you Morgan Shepard as he was in the lead, but then suddenly he went to the outside of the racetrack. The speculation is that he was simply had the air taken off of his rear spoiler. Now, drafting and aerodynamics, so many different things on a racetrack like this, and Benny Parsons can explain drafting and aerodynamics right now. Airflow, how does it work? We see the red line going across the black car. This is air going across the car, striking the rear spoiler, and we see the turbulence behind it in front of the back car. To complete, all this air is pushing the black car down, all downforce from front to rear. Now then, when the back car moves up just a little bit, we'll see what happens. You see the air smooths out, and the air across the rear spoiler moves up just a little bit. It's a neutral area. Now look what happens when the back car moves up right behind the black car. You see, the air completely misses the rear spoiler on the black car. So when Ned Jarrett and I talks about a car moved up behind and took the air off the rear spoiler, this is exactly what we're talking about. And that is what happened to Morgan Shepard just a few laps ago, and that's the reason why he lost uh, an entire lap. He came in for a pit stop. They couldn't find anything wrong with the tires. It was just simply that the air got off the rear spoiler. And that's happened to me so many times. You're coming off the corner and a car drives up behind you and it feels like the tire literally goes for look. You see Davy Allison giving a hand signal to the cars behind him. Look, I'm, I'm running across some heavy traffic, he said. I've got to slow down. Please don't run in the back of me. But that's what happens. A car drives up behind you and it takes the air off that rear spoiler. And folks, it's not the it's not the greatest feeling in the world. As a matter of fact, it's the scariest feeling in the world. Yeah, if that thing starts wiggling around a little bit, which that's what it'll make it do, and you think you got a flat tire, you're gonna want to be out there thinking you got a flat tire running for close to 200 miles an hour. Exactly right. Davy Allison moving through slower traffic, lapping some of the back markers. Allison is leading this Winston 500, and we will have more of our live coverage from Talladega in just a moment. Back at Talladega, the world's fastest speedway for the Winston 500 Winston Cup race. There's the leader, number 28, Davey Allison. The next two cars are not on the lead lap. They are Morgan Shepard and Harry Gant, but now Shepard tries to get the lap back as he heads for the high banking 33 degrees. Second place is Mark Martin. The lap leaders in this race have been Neil Bonnet, Davey Allison, Daryl Waldrop, Dale Earnhardt, Rusty Wallace. Also, Ken Schrader and Morgan Shepard. Now, we have only lost three cars. Two by, a, by a mechanical problems, namely Jimmy Means and Eddie Beerschwale. Dale Jarrett came in contact with the wall in turn number four after cutting a tire. He's okay. We have 38 cars remaining on the racetrack. And 
some of them in heavy traffic. Here comes Dale Earnhardt and Kenny Schrader. They had gotten behind that lead group when they went through all of that traffic a few laps ago, but now they've hooked up together and caught them back. Average speed of the race at the end of 80 laps, 177.99 miles an hour. Look at Mark Martin up on the high side. He don't want to give that spot up. He Earnhardt just don't and want to. Earnhardt and Schrader right there trying to take the spot away from him, though. And there, that car in the back is Bob Whitman's car, driven by Derry Cope, sponsored by Pure Later. It's good to see Bob back. And Rick Wilson has come in for a pit stop, an unscheduled stop. They go to work on the right side, or is it an unscheduled stop? Well, it would be pretty close to, to regular pit stop time. Won't be too far away. We'll see more of them coming in. You can see one mechanic making a huge chassis adjustment to the left rear of that car. He was screwing down on it, which meant the car was loose. He was putting more weight on that left rear wheel. He has his service headed back out. You see, that's one thing. When they use the restrictor plates, the fellas want to leave that rear spoiler, the black thing on the rear deck of Rick Wilson's car. They want to lay it down just as much as they possibly can, and therefore, to adjust the chassis, they're having to do it with the wrenches, as we saw that fellow screwing like crazy on that left rear wrench. Davey Allison running by himself now in the lead. He's got two cars with him, but they are not in the same lap. And here is Neil Bonnet. Jerry Punch is there to call this stop. Well, the Wood Brothers, one of the best on pit road for a long, long time. Won't be gone the Sitco Ford for Neil Bonnet. He is getting right side tires, one can of fuel. They are changing the right side tires. 54-year-old Leonard Wood, one of the quickest 54-year-old tire changers in the business working on that car. They whip around that air hose. He is down and away. Good pit stop for Neil Bonnet. Most of the cars, gentlemen, will be coming in in the next two laps. They are waiting for Earnhardt. They are waiting for Darrell Waltrip and many others to come in. It has been roughly 46 laps at their last gas stop. That's about 123 miles. That's about as far as they want to fetch this early here in the afternoon. We have not seen big tire problems in this race, as we have seen many times on the Winston Cup Trail so far in 1989, and that is certainly something very good to see. Yeah, it was good not to... Here comes Dale Earnhardt into the pits now. It's good that, that we didn't have a uh, tire problem at the top of the show. Jerry Punch. Dale Earnhardt brings the good race Chevrolet Luma down the pit road. They will change right side tires. They want to get him in and out. It's very important to get him back up front. They're concerned not with this pit stop, but they jack some weight in the right side of the car, the right rear. They beat a little bit smaller up just a little bit. 14.7 seconds. He's down and away, but the reason they wanted a good pit stop here, we're just eight laps away from a $10,000 lap here at Talladega, and Earnhardt wants to be out front when everybody else pits so he can leave that lap. Gentlemen? Earnhardt goes back on the track. He has to move across that blend line to pass Ron Esau, the number 18 car, but now Dale gets back down on the inside of the racetrack, and here comes the leader, Davey Allison, in for a stop. Jack Aroot will call the pit stop by the leader. Jack. Davey Allison's crew waiting for Davey to come down. He goes to work. They're getting set, and they are now going to go to work. Robert Yates and his team go to the right side. They'll be changing right side tires and taking on fuel. Now, they've already begun to do fuel calculations, and their concern was if they could go enough to be able to go the distance. They are going to have to make one more stop because they figured they'll be 13 laps short of the distance. They pull them away. It's a very quick stop for Davey Allison. Well, also having made pit stops are Phil Parsons, Kyle Petty, Nick Trickle, and Alan Kowicki. I see Bill Greg. Elliott. Bill Elliott just made a pit stop. He's coming out. Brent Budai coming out of the pit. So, as they mentioned in the pits, practically everybody coming in here in the next couple of laps. Greg Sachs going out. So is Michael Waltrip. Greg and Sachs ran out of fuel because I saw his crew pushing him down pit road. So, here's Rusty Wallace coming in. We ride with him as he stops in his pit area, and Jack Aroot is there. Barry Dotson swinging the Jack around to the right side as they go to work to take on right side Goodyear tires. They're filling up the fuel and also taking a look as Harold Elliott to the front of the car. He cleans it off, and they've still got the Jack up. They've completed the action on changing the tires, but taking on as much fuel as they can. He puts it back in gear in 14.2 seconds, and Wallace is away. Nice stop by Rusty Wallace. As there is Bill Bartdahl passing him, going out of the pits. And the number 27 Kodiak Pontiac builds up speed, headed for turn number one. Well, he'll try to stay right with Bill Bartdahl. He has a pretty fast car. Here comes Ken Schrader into the pits. And uh, in case Rusty can't catch somebody else as he goes and gets back up on the racetrack, well, Bartdahl will suffice to draft with until others come along. Okay, let's go to the pits now as Ken Schrader makes a pit stop. Kenny Schrader hits the binders nicely. The Lumina comes to rest in front of his pits. The crew goes to work. Dennis Connor pumping on the jack. Going to work, making the exchange of right side tires. And they, too, are going to add 
some weights to this Lumina. Now, the Lumina drivers have got a little bit of a disadvantage because they don't have a lot of race conditions activity behind underneath their belt. Schrader is off and away, and he has made an adjustment on the handling department as well as taking on fuel. And now, with the crew cam, here's a stop by Darrell Waltrip. Well, he got those five hook nuts back in there in a hurry. And I'm sure they made an adjustment on Darrell's car, too, when he made that pit stop. He had lost the lead draft. Here's Meanwhile, Mark Martin, who had taken over the lead of Lee Bob. Yes, he had indeed. Jerry Punch will call this stop as the previous leader now comes in for a stop. 30-year-old Mark Martin, the Mitchell, Arkansas driver, brings the stroll light forward to a halt. They go pumping that right side jack and will change right side tires. Real important to get him back on the racetrack as quickly as possible. One can of fuel tossed across the wall. Second can of Unical gasoline going in. 11 car is a leader. That is Terry Labonte trying to get Martin down the way. 16.3 10 seconds. He smokes the tire in a down pit road. Gentlemen. The Jack Roush owned Stroh Light Ford Thunderbird moves back out onto the racetrack with Mark Martin behind the wheel. And now, with all the pit stops having been made, or most of them having been made, it's the number 11 car of Terry Labonte. That leads, but he has not made a stop. Now he is. He's pitting Terry Labonte. One of the last to bring his car in for the second routine pit stop. Jerry Punch will call this as the Junior Johnson crew goes to work. They go to the right side of the car. Pete Wright will slam that jack beneath the car. They're pumping. Mike Hill and the crew now changing right side tires. Tim Brewer and the Budweiser crew trying to get those tires on the Junior Johnson car. Jeff Bodai now moving down pit road. He has changed tires. Been back in for an unscheduled stop. Fuel in the car. They push it down pit road. 14.3 seconds, Terry Levani is away. We're seeing pit stops in the neighborhood of 14 to 16 seconds. And by the way, Jeff Bodine was in for a second time. But now, Terry Levani out on the racetrack once again as the lead will go back now to Davey Allison with everybody having completed their second required pit stop of the afternoon. Davey Allison from nearby Bessemer, Hueytown, Alabama has the lead in the Winston 500. We'll be back in just a moment. Things pretty much his way at the moment, leading the Winston 500, but behind him, the battle is for second position, and it involves the number 25 car of Ken Schrader, also the nine car of Bill Elliott. The six car of Mark Martin is also right there, as is Terry Labonte and Bill Markdahl. I tell you what, Davy Allison just hopes that they don't catch him. I don't think they're going to, because the next time by, he wins $10,000. That's the Gillette right guard half to halfway challenge, and it comes up this coming time around. And the driver who leaves the race at the halfway point picks up $10,000 from the Gillette right guard people. And it appears as if it's going to be Davy Allison, because he is running well ahead of everybody else at the moment. He is running very low on the racetrack through the third and fourth turns. Now comes off the 33-degree banking onto the 18-degree banking. He comes through the trioval. That's normally where the start-finish line is, right there, but not here at Talladega. He approaches it, however, and now crosses it. Davey Allison wins $10,000 leading at the halfway point. I tell you what, I don't know how those these people in the stands knew that because they all stood up and cheered when he went by. And Jack Arute is with Robert Yates, and I'm sure a happy Robert Yates. Well, Robert Yates, congratulations. Thus far at the halfway mark, at least you've made $10,000. Well, uh, we appreciate that. We appreciate people for putting that money up. Uh, right, but they didn't get the flag at time by. We're a little bit nervous about it. So they're going to do one more just, to, just in case, guys, one more time. Well, the scoreboard didn't change. It's still on lap number 93. It was on lap number 93 last time, too, so maybe there has been a bit of a... Uh, you mean all those fans cheered for nothing? Of a lap count difference. Well, anyway, this is the safety lap. It doesn't make a bit of difference because Davey Allison's going to lead it, too. And now, here is Jeff Bodine's in-car camera as Davey Allison laps him. He just drives to the inside and motors on by Jeff Bodine. He needs for Bodine to stay on his rear bumper. He needs to slow down a little bit and let Jeff catch him. This is one time that going slower would be better because those two guys might be able to drive away from those cars behind them. And right now, the second, third, fourth, and fifth place cars are catching up to Davey Allison. They are really game on it because they are drafting in a single line. And uh, it won't be too long until they'll be back up with him. We see from out of Bodine's car, this, the gap between he and Davey Allison is not quite
wide enough. He's not quite close enough. Boy, look at this gaggle of cars. 71 day Marcus is there, so is Brett Bodine. And here is the second place group. And indeed, they have really closed in. They're passing by Jeff Bodine, Schrader, Labonte, Mark Martin. And Bill Elliott and the others really close in now on Davey Allison. And that, again, is evidenced by the draft. Yeah, he was uh, a good three or four seconds ahead of them about five or six laps ago. And they just uh, hooked up together in the draft. And you can pick up a second, second and a half, sometimes two seconds a lap uh, running together the way that they're doing. Poor old Bodine. You know, he was... Well, look at here. Schrader goes by Davey Allison. He takes the lead going in three. The Chevy Lumina passes the Ford Thunderbird, and Ken Schrader goes back out into front position. Any theories, guys, on how he was able to do that so easily? That's because he caught it. You know, he made up a few car lengths down the back straightaway, and he had so much momentum going for him, Bob. It was easy to drive by. You see Davey Allison right now. He's only a car length behind a half a car length. He doesn't have any momentum going down the back straightaway. If he would back up to Elliott, two or three car lengths, and then they would go together, the momentum they would go by with ease. This is the racetrack that we have seen the most number of lead changes, 75 in one Winston Cup race a few years ago. We haven't had that many yet, but we're not nearly done with this race. We'll be right back. NASCAR's Winston Cup Division on a very bright, sunshiny day, presenting the Winston 500 from Talladega Super Speedway. It is Ken Schrader leading and Davey Allison running in second position. We mentioned how it has rained here. It rained Thursday. It rained most of Friday after they finally did get the, the qualifying finished on Friday morning. It rained almost all Friday afternoon. It was a nice day yesterday, but it's even nicer day today. Temperature in the 60s. And just a very delightful day for the thousands of race fans who have turned out to watch this. We have a crash in turn number two. The caution flag comes out once again. Dick Trickle apparently is the reason for the caution flag is now the cars. There you can see Trickle who has slid to the grass inside of the racetrack. Meanwhile, the leaders have had an opportunity now to get down off the banking in the fourth turn and come in for some pit stops. And here is Schrader and Davey Allison and Mark Martin and others making stops. Well, they... And Ken Schrader, Stop. guys, has gone to work, and he is taking left side tires during this stop, getting a clean of his windshield. They've filled the tank full of gas, and as Connor drops the jack, he puts it back in gear, and Schrader is off and away. Davey Allison is also on pit road. It's a bunch of cars come in. Allison getting his work on the left side as well. Directly in front of him is Rusty Wallace and the car number four of Rick Wilson. As there's a lot of activity here on pit road as Jim Sauter goes <laughs> screaming down through the grassy infield area that separates the racetrack from the pits, but he goes back out on the racetrack. It is really wild down here right now, guys. You think it's wild right now? You wait about 30, 40 seconds. It's really going to be wild because, Jack, that was only about 25% of the field. The rest of them will be in the next lap. As we watch Rusty Wallace and Rick Wilson leave the pit area. And Rick Wilson. Here is uh, Daryl Waltrip on the right side of your screen. He cannot make the stop. Meanwhile, it is uh, Sauter who was in the grassy area. So Daryl Waltrip also has a problem selecting his pit and finding it. He decides to go on by. Well, he was pretty far back from the leaders. Here's Terry Labonte into the pits and getting right side tires. Now they go around to the left side. That's Junior Johnson walking around the car there, and Jerry Punch is there. Well, they're changing tires also in the well, Terry Labonte car, but also in Bill Elliott got it getting four tires, the Coors cars and the Budweiser cars, both beer machines coming in for four tires. I tell you, at the upper end of pit road, gentlemen, it was very hairy up here when Jim Sauter came on the pit road. Apparently, he got the right side tires over in the grass, and uh, he just about to the car in the pit stop after doing a go around. Well, Darrell Walter must be getting the chassis a little bit closer because the adjustment. There's Dick Trippin coming in the pits. Doesn't seem to be a lot of damage. Jack Carew 
Is there? Well, taking a look at Rusty Wallace's car, there doesn't seem to be a bunch of damage on his car. They're going to the left side tires. And, the, and what they're taking a look at is Dick, Dick Trickle is... Actually, we cannot see Dick Trickle's car. We're here in Rusty Wallace's pit. And Wallace pulls out, and he's away as he's made his exchange, and we'll wait for Dick Trickle to make his position here. We're watching Rusty Wallace from the in-car camera as he shifts gears and goes back out onto the racetrack. Didn't appear to be any damage to that Dick Trickle car, and they are, as you saw, making some uh, tire replacements there, but it appears as if Dick Trickle will be able to get back into the race. He was the reason for our second caution period of the afternoon, the one that we are under right now. And we have word that he did blow a tire. That is the reason why Dick Trickle was in the grass a few minutes ago, but now is about to go back on the racetrack. We're glad you could join us on this Sunday afternoon at the world's fastest speedway, Talladega Super Speedway in Alabama for the Winston 500. Under our second caution period of the afternoon, the first one was caused by Dale Jarrett, who hit the wall in turn number four. And uh, this most recent one caused by Dick Trickle, who uh, cut a tire and slid to the grass in turn number two. Now, Jackaroo, we tried to get him to report on this pit stop, and we can't understand why he was only about a mile away from this car. But anyway, this is what happened during the pit stop by Dick Trickle. They're simply replacing the windshield on the car, and that isn't really much of an effort for these Winston Cup cars. He is uh, now back in as we come back to live action, and they're in the trunk of the car. What might that be all about? Jerry Punch. Well, they got, they got a lot of sheet metal damage in the rear of the car. When he spun, he just ripped the rear fender of the car open. You know, he blew all four tires. You can see the tire. This is the right front tire that he actually cut down when he smacked the wall over there. The tires are very, very little left of this tire, but they are working on the Dick Trickle car, and they have a lot of damage, sheet metal damage in the trunk. It's basically your flow-through ventilation now in this Buick. Uh, they have air coming up through the fenders inside the trunk, trying to pull the trunk lid apart. So Dick Trickle having his trouble after a great run here, a rookie, and for 700 short track wins. So we are continuing here at Talladega Super Speedway under caution for the spin by Dick Trickle. Stay tuned. We'll be back for more action. The Winston 500 in 1988 turned out to be a day that Phil Parsons will remember forever. After qualifying in third position for the race, Phil is able to pull out to an early lead, pursuing closely Ken Schrader and Jeff Bodine. A couple of laps later, Parsons moves high and gets out of the draft. He's passed by Schrader. And then, three abreast, Bodine and Bobby Allison also get by him. But quickly, he regains the lead. Has yet, however, to make a pit stop. And as a matter of fact, coming out of turn two, he runs out of fuel. With the rest of the field going by, Phil, however, is able to make it into the pit area and barely returns to the racetrack on the lead lap. Ken Schrader is about to put a lap on him, but Kenny spins out, and Phil escapes the close call. Don't count Phil out, though. He catches the leader, Jeff Bodine, and he holds on to get the checkered flag and win the 1988 Winston 500, his first-ever Winston Cup victory. And as you rejoin us, the cars cross the line and take the green flag, and we are back to racing on lap number 104. And Benny, if you can't win yourself, I'm sure it's always nice to see a family member win like Bill did last year. You know, your first Winston Cup victory is unbelievable, but to do it in a race as big as the Winston 500, it had to be incredible. I know he was just, well, I know it. I've talked to him several times, thrilled with it. And by the way, this is the first time that Benny has missed a Winston 500 after 19 in a row. Wish you were out there? No, 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 no. Looks like hard work to me. <laughs> Schrader, Mark Martin, first and second. Davey Allison, third, then comes Bill Elliott. Terry Levani running in fifth position. We might add that that caution flag just a moment ago was a tremendous break for Harry Gant and Morgan Shepard because of their unscheduled pit stops. They had, did not have to stop under the green flag conditions. The other cars did, so therefore they're back in the lead lap right now, both Morgan Shepard and Harry Gant. And we see Morgan Shepard right now running in sixth spot. That second-place car there in line, though, second place in the race, is driven by Mark Martin, and there is Morgan Shepard. Now, there is uh, Mark Martin.
in car number six. Not only does he win the Unical money and, and win uh, $53,000 if he wins this race, but he would also qualify for the Winston. Now, if he would qualify for the Winston, it would knock Richard Petty out of that race, just like uh, Bill Parsons did last year. And Richard is back in the Winston because of the retirement that we've had in Winston Cup competition. But right now, Mark Martin seems to be headed backwards instead of forwards. He's got his problems. The 25 came off the trial and went to the bottom of the racetrack. Davy Allison dove under Martin and got some air off Kenny Schrader's car. And everyone else followed the 28 car of Davy Allison. And all those cars, all four of them, passed Mark Martin. Oh, it is frustrating, no question about it, but there wasn't anything you could do about it once he got in that position. So he's uh, back there at the tail end of that six-car draft and just have to try to find him a spot to make that there was a big picture right in front of him. He just came out of the end, so, a moment ago. So. Here's Davey Allison making a bid for the lead. He has the lead, I believe. <laughs> no, nope, Davey Allison is going to have it. But Allison is going to have to do something here as they go into the turn. And Dick Trickle on the bottom side. Schrader and Allison running wheel to wheel. And here is Bill Elliott right there also. He's hooked up with Schrader in the outside draft. Here's Davey Allison trying to draft on Dick Trickle. He knows Trickle's been fast today, but he realizes he's got some problems, so he decides to pull on the outside of him, make three abreast going into the turn. Great job by Ken Schrader. Started 21st. He was the fastest second-day qualifier. Kenny got his first Winston Cup victory last year. So we ask him, what's your goal for 1989? We feel that as bad as we ran last year and wind up fifth, that if we can keep our consistency and improve, a little, improve on our on track performance, or actually how fast we actually run, that uh, we can win that championship. And that's, that's number one. Uh, we'd like to win all the races. But uh, we'll take one race, two races, no races, in lieu of that championship. And right now, Ken Schrader is 14th in Winston Cup points, 308 behind the leader, Dale Earnhardt. He is, however, the, replay, the uh, leader of this race at the moment. And recall what happened here just a year ago as Schrader spun down the backstretch, and we all held our breath because we saw the air get under that car just slightly, but it held to the racetrack. You know, he spun and didn't hit anything. He finished fifth. You know, unbelievable. That was probably one of the greatest driving jobs I've ever seen in my life. Most of the time, I say, and it's the truth, the drivers close their eyes. But in that situation, I think Schroeder was driving the car. Now, as we watch these guys draft each other here, there are six cars in the lead draft. Let's follow up on sort of a joking uh, question I asked you a few minutes ago, but regarding whether you would rather be out there. What do you think, sitting up here watching the race and watching these guys dice for position and going 190 miles an hour, it's a lot different up here. It, it's probably more exciting for you than it actually is in a race car. Well, it is more exciting. This is absolutely the greatest fun in the world up here watching these guys and getting excited at the job that they do but right now the middle the middle aspect is what's a killer right now because these fellas have to try to figure out what to do how to stay in that lead rep look at davy look at davy wave to mark <laughs> if that baby is getting behind him, we'll go to the front yeah davy got in the same position a moment ago and went all the way to the back and mark martin had gotten in and uh, mark's not gonna let him <laughs> get back up there no way <laughs> but you see mentally now how exasperated that is for Davey Allison to have a car as fast as his is and not be able to lead the race or just pass at will. It's so hard mentally to be able to accept these things. But it's fun. Of Here's to Mark Martin looking to the inside of Morgan Shepard and pulls back into line. Davey Allison has dropped all the way back to sixth position. That looked like that was one of those old hind six hand signal from Morgan Shepard to tell Mark Martin let's go and Mark Mark pulled down to go with him but Morgan said he didn't have enough momentum going so he backed up behind Terry Lamont. Bill Elliott runs second trying to pass Ken Schrader for the lead. There were many questions going into this race because of the restrictor plate. How difficult will it be for you to pass in this event? See this will be virtually impossible. Uh, you know, the deal is, is there's a lot of drastic difference in speeds, you know, and if you get somebody, either a guy can help you or hurt you, you get hooked up with the wrong guy, he's going to hurt you, you get hooked up with the right guy, he's going to help you. 
you know, and if, if, he, if he can work with you the whole race, then you might be a pretty good team, and that's all it's going to take. Well, perhaps we recall more than any other time when two cars worked together in a draft was during last year's Firecracker uh, 400 at Daytona when he and Rick Wilson got hooked up together, and they just were excellent together. Well, Rick Wilson was leading the race, caught Bill Elliott, put him a lap down. And when he ran up behind that Ford Thunderbird, he found how fast he could run. He ran away from the second, third, fourth, and fifth place cars and let Bill Elliott stay in front of him. Now we see some passing going on. Here's Morgan Shepard trying to pass Bill Elliott to take over second place. Let's see if he can make it stick. He's got to have somebody to come with him. Here comes Terry Labonte. He's coming with him in the Budweiser Ford, so they're going to shift the car number nine right on back. And just like Bill Elliott said there a moment ago, you've got to have somebody to work with you. Well, Morgan Shepard had somebody working with him, and look at him. Now Morgan. Right up on the outside. Yep. Right. Morgan is looking for the lead, and he's got Terry Labonte to help him push the car ahead, and I believe that's what's going to happen. They come through the trioval. Schrader is to the inside in the red number 25. Shepard, the white and blue car to the outside, and as they cross the line, it is Morgan Shepard who has the lead. He can thank Terry Labonte there for assisting him in that move. Labonte is on the outside. Schrader now to the inside, however, is going to hold on, it appears, to that second spot. Davey Allison is behind him. Now Allison will move, move high into the outside draft. If Allison gets in, then Schrader's hung out to dry. He's going back to six. I believe that's what's going to happen. Everybody is in the outside draft with the exception of Ken Schrader, but you know, that Lumina hangs right in there, maintaining four spot. Now moving alongside of Davey Allison in third. And I believe Schrader is going to have third position as they come out of the corner. If he can get back up in line, he can't do it. So great racing is continuing. Again, we'll be watching this all during the afternoon. We hope you'll stay with us for all of the Winston 500 here at Talladega Super Speed. Winston 500 NASCAR race from Talladega, Alabama, live here on ESPN on a beautiful spring afternoon. And the leader is Davey Allison. After 116 laps of this race, he has just passed Terry Labonte to go into the lead. Labonte running second. Bill Elliott is also right there, along with Morgan Shepard and Mark Martin. There are six cars that are in the lead draft, and there they are. Well, we had four cars that Fords that started up front. Now we have four Fords that are running the first four positions. And I should say there are seven cars in the lead draft as Ken Schrader dropped behind just a little bit, but now has caught back up once again. We have seen a tremendous amount of passing in this race, not necessarily because of horsepower, because of the restrictor plate, but boy, I tell you, drafting is really providing some great passing and great dicing for the lead. Now, Mark Martin runs there in fourth position. Let's go down to Jerry Punch for a comment on Mark. Well, gentlemen, the crew can't figure out what the problem is. The car set on the pole here was so fast all week long in practice and qualifying, but today... Trouble coming off a of turn two. A car has fun coming off a of turn two. We see the leaders coming into turn four, but one car did spin around coming off the turn two. He's down on the inside, down on the grass. Yellow flag comes out. Harold Kinder is waving the yellow flag, and here come the leaders. We'll see who crosses the line first. It's going to be Davy Allison. Labonte will follow in second position. Bill Elliott trying to catch third. I don't know whether he did or not. He and Mark Martin crossed the first at the same time. There's Dale Earnhardt coming in for a pit stop. And the car that spun off of turn number two is Dick Trickle once again for the second time. Let's go to Jack Aroot. Well, the crew goes to work on Dale Earnhardt's car on the right side tires. The gas going in as well. And they're trying to make the change here. Kirk Shelmerdeen doing the work on the right front. They are going to go for four tires all the way around. A breathing room here under caution. He ducked on a pit road very quickly. Chocolate Myers completing the refueling action here on the Mr. Goodwrench Lumina. They dropped the jack and he is off and away. The first of the leaders to pit. Now these cars that we're seeing pit right now were a little ways behind those, that six cars that we saw running up front. And they got the caution early enough when they came off turn four that they could come into the pits. The others were already past pit road, the end of pit road, before they got the caution, those running up front. Now here's a Dick Trickle spin. He's to the inside. Watch him slide sideways coming off of two. Looks like the back end just got loose on him as he came around with the other cars, spun down to the inside of the racetrack. 
The back end just ripped it up on it, it looked like. Now we'll see everybody else come into the pits as they come off a of turn four. They are lined up, waiting to come in for their pit stops. Allison, Labonte, Elliott, Mark Martin, Ken Schrader. Here they come. Pit Road becomes the busiest place in this part of Alabama. I'd like to run that gas station, Bob. <laughs> Say what? <laughs> you got a captive audience. Of course, if you have that many workers out there, well, you know, that can work this fast, it might not be too bad. Let's go down to Jerry Punch, who's in Bill Elliott's pit. Well, the Melly Ford getting service. He is down and away. Right side tire. The goal of close call. And the car comes down pit road. Red Eckler, everyone scampering back. Put them out of the grass margin. And Darrell Waltrip is in. Jack Arood is there. Jack and Jerry, Darrell Waltrip is making continuous chassis adjustments on his car, as well as checking on the right front area of the car. Looks like they may have a problem possibly with the spring. As you know, it's tough to see on the right side. They're jacking a lot of wedge down in that area. They've completed the work in there. Now Eddie Dickerson is putting the tire back on. And Jeff Hammond is dropping the jack. But they are going to change all four tires. This is a very long stop for Walter, but he's literally been out of the hunt since the early going. So they're going to have to make some major adjustments here and then bring him back out onto the racetrack. Well, Jack, the reason they made the adjustment on the right front that time, that is the strongest spring on the car. When you make an adjustment there, it has more effect than anywhere else on the race car. And so while they had that tire off during the caution period, they said this is when we're going to make that major adjustment. Caution period number three on Talladega Super Speedway at the moment. Dick Trickle, he is the reason for the caution flag. And once again, we see that the windshield has come out of that race car. We'll be back after this. Again, a bit of a breather here at Talladega as the yellow flag is out once again. Dr. Jerry Punch is down in the pit of Dick Trickle, who has brought out our third caution period of the day, like he did our second. Gary? It's good to be a habit for Dick Trickle. Two tire changes and a windshield. He, again, had to come back in. They had a lot of sheet metal damage on the right front of the car, and apparently that sheet metal was rubbing a tire. They came in. He thought he smelled some rubber burning in the car, radioed in, but before he could get back to pit road, he had cut another right front tire and spun the car. But they had changed the windshield and changed the tires and beat some sheet metal back out, so he will be here a while. He'll be back on the track momentarily. Bob? All right. Dick Trickle ran so well in the early going but has experienced some problems. Now, we're going to replay it again, and we'll see if we can... Uh, observe the windshield popping out of the car. That's trickled to the inside. Watch the car get sideways. All at once, it just goes around. The back end picks up on the car. And there, yep. you see the windshield pop out and flap in there. Now, we go to the in-car camera. Rusty Wallace's and ahead will be Dick Trickle. And again, we'll see if we can watch the, see if we can see the windshield pop out. Yes! Oh, very evident. On Rusty Wallace's <laughs> in-car camera. And he's watching his old buddy Trickle going sliding through the grass. Couple of ASA veterans. Now here is the crew cam, Eddie Dickerson, as he is making an adjustment there on the right front of the car. Yeah, he's, he's turning down on that uh, screw, the adjustment there on the right front screen. That is setting weight to the left rear of the car. That's what it's called. This was earlier. making the tire change on the Darrell Waltrip car and on lap number 121 we go back to racing the leader is Rusty Wallace second place Kyle Petty third is Dale Earnhardt fourth Bill Parsons and fifth is Rick Wilson so the standings have definitely been scrambled here because of these pit stops and there's the bumper cam from Rusty Wallace's car looking back on second place Kyle Petty and we have a spin in turn number four. Ron Esau has spun and dropped to the infield. And that happened in turn number four as the cars, the rest of the field was in turn number one and two. And the yellow is coming out. And there's some cars like Ricky Rudd that wants to get his lap back. Let's see if he can race back to the flag and do it. Well, this is the first real race back to the caution that we have had, at least some drivers trying to get their laps back. Ricky Rudd is trying desperately to hold that inside line and get it back, but I don't believe he's going to do it. No, I don't think he will, no. Neither he nor Greg Sachs can get the lap back. You notice every time they have a caution flag, you notice the common thing, Rusty Wallace ends up leading the race. Why is that? <laughs> <laughs> 
That's a good pitch crew. Well, while we have an opportunity and while the uh, caution flag is out once again, we will get rid of as many commercial breaks as we possibly can. There's Ron Esau, who has fun in turn number four. Back with more after these messages. They're brought to you by the Robert Bosch Corporation, makers of Bosch Platinum, the ultimate spark plug. J.D. McDuffie's 1988 fiery crash at Daytona during the 125-mile qualifiers have accounted for two major rule changes in safety for NASCAR in 1989. We've already told you about the one that requires special hooks on all four points of the frame rails to assist safety crews in towing a car off. Well, here's the other one. Now, in the past, crews were allowed to take this area here and position their oil tank for their holding dry sump system on an engine. But during the fiery crash, that ruptured with J.D., so now NASCAR has mandated a new change in 1989. Those holding tanks must be behind the firewall. Now, where do most teams put them nowadays? Right inside the cockpit and behind the driver, out of harm's way and no longer a fire hazard. Another one of the rule changes that has come along in NASCAR Winston Cup competition. The fans are relaxing for a moment while the caution is still out at Talladega, and that allows us to take another break. From Rusty Wallace's in-car camera, we are still under caution here at Talladega. The pace car position just ahead of Rusty Wallace, who is the leader of this race. And so while there is no action on the racetrack, we'll entertain you a little bit here with Benny Parsons' Hat of the Week. He has a different one for each race that we televise here on ESPN. Here's the man himself with this week's hat. This week for the Hat of the Week, we had a tie. John Farrell from Shippensburg, Pennsylvania sent this hat down, and it is the ultimate race fan's hat. You want a drink, you just take a sip. It's got microphones, got everything. John, thank you very much. This is going to Ned Jarrett's Celebrity Auction in Newton, North Carolina, American Cancer Society. Don Naiman called me from the International Motorsports Hall of Fame here in Talladega. He said he'd like me to bring attention to the Hall of Fame. And folks, they have some delightful stuff here to see. But about the same time, I re received in the mail a, a press release from the Autosport Gallery in Raleigh, North Carolina, and they said they was going to have a painting today. You see Phil Parsons winning the Winston 500 last year. This is the thrill of victory. But I remember back in 1983, five years before that, when Phil Parsons did this down in turn one at Talladega. This is the agony of defeat. So Don Naiman, yes, the hat fit very well. And it's going to Tom Ustry, the ARCA driver who was injured in Daytona in this year in February. He's having a celebrity auction next Saturday night in Bobby Joe Blue's barn in Vast, North Carolina. So the hat's going for the celebrity auction there. Pay lots of money. Tom needs the money. Thanks. <laughs> And uh, if you would like to send in your candidate for Hat of the Week, there's the address, Benny Parsons, 112 Main Street, Ellerby, North Carolina, 28338. Our ESPN crew, led by Neil Goldberg and Mike Wells, doing a great job on timing as we come back from commercial. The cars cross the line, and we resume the racing. That is Rusty Wallace leading, and here's how it looks from the bumper can. That's Ricky Rudd in the Quaker State Buick right behind him. Ricky right now running in 21st place, one lap back there, 20 cars still in the lead lap. We'll listen and watch from the bumper can. Well, we had a lead change, so we'll go back and show you it. Now Dale Earnhardt in car number three and... And Davey Allison in car number 28 have streaked away from everybody else. Well, they had some momentum built up and just blew on by the rest of us. Attrition has been very low in this race. There is Earnhardt and Davey Allison really hooked up in a trap now as Allison goes to the inside. Morgan Shepard is there in third position in car number 75. Then comes Phil Parsons, last year's winner. And Allison has the lead again, taking it from Dale. Well, his car is strong. This is unbelievable. Look behind. Look right behind those guys. Look at those cars right behind them. Look at the race cars. They look like they ought to be stopped on the freeway or doing 10 miles an hour. But yet they're running 200 miles an hour down there. Here's Morgan Shepard looking to the inside of Dale Earnhardt. Nope, he decides to get back up into the line. You know, fellas, you have to wonder, there's a lot of the drivers were critical of their restrictor plates, and especially when they went down to the 15, 16 inch restrictor plate they're using here. But uh, maybe that has to be a lot of fun out there. It's frustrating to a degree, but also it's a lot of fun because when you can, can 
hook up with somebody else and blow past the mic uh, Davey Allison did Dale Earnhardt there. That's got to be a great feeling of accomplishment. Wait, 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 wait. There is no way that this is fun. I don't care what you tell me. <laughs> well, it is fun. No of way. Of course it is. Not at 190 miles an hour. Well, I mean, I look here. Look at Phil. He wants to get by. He says, come on, guys. Let me, I won the race last year. Let me win again. Two in a row. Come on, one time. And we haven't seen Phil that much here today, but he's been in that top 20 on the lead lap. Had a good pit stop the last time, and here he is now running in fourth place. We recapped his victory here last year a few moments ago in our Winston Cup replay, and this is the view from Rusty Wallace's Kodiak Pontiac as he watches ahead and sees Phil and the others. Rusty Wallace is watching those cars just motor away ever so slowly. Rusty Wallace, I don't know if he's got enough muscle to win today or not because he was up front just a moment ago and now he's back about 20 car lengths. Yeah, he has not been one of the fastest cars, but as you pointed out earlier, it seems like after every pit stop, he's the fellow that comes out first. He's got a great pit crew, but the car is running good, but not as good as others. So Rusty Wallace started this race from 26th position. He is up to fifth right now. We ask him, can you win starting from so far back in the field? Starting 25th is going to be tough. There's no doubt about that. Last time here, I started 24th. I was able to finish the race in fifth position. And that was a long way to go. It took all day to get there. It really did. Uh, drafting so important here, it's unreal. Getting a good partner to work with is unreal. And we've done this so many times now that I've learned that everybody's out for themselves until they day in Daytona. So, it's a situation where you might have one part in one lap, you might have another one the next lap, and it just keeps changing. Whenever an opportunity arises, the driver's going to take advantage of that. And, uh, yeah, I think I can win for 25th. The stranger things have happened, the stranger things have happened in that here at Talladega. No doubt about that. Rusty Wallace would like to win from that far back, looking at the in-car camera. But he said that the problem they have here is that the body design they have that works so well for them on the short track and intermediate tracks has so much downforce, they can't get their car to run well at big tracks like Talladega and Daytona. Now, they have a Pontiac. Now, one Pontiac that does run real well is Morgan Shepard's car. It's not the Pontiac itself. It's the way they build the cars and hang the fenders. Looking at the bumper cam there for Rusty Wallace. You see Rick Wilson tripping up on the rear of the Rusty Wallace car. Wilson makes a little big move to the outside. They're really getting crowded down towards turn one. Right on the rear deck of Rusty Wallace's car. No. Unbelievable. <laughs> I mean, if you've got a 40-inch screen at home, you've got a face full of Oldsmobile right there, don't you? Man, man. They're running 191 miles an hour. That's the average around this 2.66-mile racetrack. Here's Kyle Petty and Rick Wilson. Look at that, folks. I mean, 195 miles an hour. Sterling Marlin going to try to go by. Harry Gant going to follow him. Rick Wilson, he's hung up behind Rusty Wallace. It's called Rusty Gone. And all of those cars, Sterling Marlin, Rick Wilson, Kyle Petty, they're all in the lead lap. Of Sterling Marlin and now Phil Parsons he's in the middle there looks like he's slowing down well maybe just uh, momentarily lost a little bit of air and uh, had to back out of the throttle I think that's the case Phil was running with those uh, front three cars up there a little bit ago but he just couldn't hang on to the draft his car's not quite as strong as it was here a year ago that's Sterling Marlin down low on the inside. So is Phil Parsons and Harry Gant. Gant makes it three wide. Kyle Petty on the outside, Phil in the middle, and then Gant on the inside. Here comes Terry Labonte at number 11, and there's also Daryl Waltrip running the low line. Now, Waltrip seems to be back to, to sprint now as he's able to hang in there with him, at least at this point. Oh! oh. Alka Wicky came down and didn't realize Harry Gant was there and almost moved right into Harry Gant as he was coming the view from the rear window of Harry Gant. That's when it's got to be not fun. That is not, like that. no, that's not fun, no. You know, but right now, Davey Allison's having fun. He's leading the race, but these guys, I don't know if it's too much fun. Jeff Bodine on the left. He's trying to go by Harry Gant, but yet not quite enough to get by. Sterling Marlin and Harry Gant still on the inside. And, you know, Sterling Marlin, when Harry Gant was beside Phil Parsons going down the back straightaway a moment ago, it looked like Sterling Marlin moved over and gave Harry some help. Like, these two guys maybe flipped up. Let's go to the front. 
because we can't do it by ourselves. We have to hook up, and here you go. They're going by Rusty Wallace. Yeah, Benny, they need to do it. But Rusty Wallace was leading this race not too long ago. Now Davey Allison and the crew that he's pulling up front are four seconds ahead of this group back here as they jockey for position. Now that Marlin and Gant have pulled themselves out in single file, they might be able to cut some of that distance down, maybe pull away from that group behind them. Now the first seven cars are running by themselves and then this whole gaggle of cars trailing. And there is the lead draft. Davey Allison leads it, then Dale Earnhardt, then Morgan Shepard, Ken Schrader, and Neil Bonnet. He's back in the lead draft. You know, he had trouble at the beginning of the race. Car got too loose. He changed tires. Mason Cassie has got Look at him, right back there in the fifth spot. And the last Bill Elliott is in the sixth spot. Bob Martin in the seventh spot. Sorry, Bob Jenkins, we're not trying to do your job, but I was excited about Neil Bonnet getting back up there. I'm having a good time just watching <laughs> along with you guys. <laughs> and speaking of Neil Bonnet, the Wood Brothers have only had one super speedway win the past five years. That was when Kyle Petty won in Charlotte in May of 1987. They certainly would like to capture a victory here this afternoon. There's the Wood Brothers Ford, driven by Neil Bonnet. Of course, this is Neil's home track. He lives down in Westmore, Alabama. Birmingham's about uh, 40, and uh, Huey Town is on the uh, west side of Birmingham. There are the lead seven cars still running right together, nose to tail, in the lead draft. And now we see Morgan Shepard and, and uh, Ken Schrader looking to the inside of Dale Earnhardt. They had some ideas, but Earnhardt came down and blocked away. Now, I want you to watch this. Look at Harry again. We're going to go back and see Harry again and the 94 car Sterling Marlin. You remember just a moment ago they passed Rusty Wallace? Now, look at the gap between their cars and the car of Rusty Wallace. Well, they have hooked up and have taken off, and uh, Ben, we'll take a look, but they might be gaining on the front cars, except if they just passed, had a pass uh, Gant went around Marlin. Maybe he figured he could run faster in front, so uh, they'll try that for a while. Deals being made for drafting partners in this race as Sterling Marlin and Harry Gann have decided they're going to run together. First one uh, leading the other, and the lead group passes the uh, start finish line, but Davey Allison still in the lead, and Morgan Shepard goes for second and passes Dale Earnhardt. Now, our Napa race summary shows that. Davey Allison had led 73 in the first 135 laps at an average speed of 162.120 miles an hour. Nine leaders, 25 lead changes, four caution periods, total 15 laps and 20 cars were on the lead lap at the end of 135. Lap leaders include Neil Bonnet, Davey Allison, Daryl Waltrip, Dale Earnhardt, Rusty Wallace, and also Ken Schrader, Morgan Shepard, Terry Labonte, and Mark Martin. Out of race. Well, there haven't been that many cars drop out. Jimmy Beans is out of the race. So is Dale Jarrett, Eddie Mearshwale, and Ron Esau. And Dale Jarrett and Ron Esau are out of competition because of some minor incidents on the racetrack. We have had no major crashes. Things have really been competitive in the Winston 500. Track here in Talladega. As it is not bicycle racing, but in many ways we have seen similarities between bicycle racing and the action on the track today. Is drafting and first one leading and then the other has definitely played a role in what has happened so far. At the moment it is Davey Allison leading and then six cars behind him. Dale Earnhardt on the outside, Morgan Shepard 75 car on the inside, then Ken Schrader in 25, Neil Bonnet, Bill Elliott, and Mark Martin. It's a good thing that these guys aren't leading the race because they've never figured out how to divide the points or the money or anything else. And Robert Yates, the chief wrench on this leading car, number 28, driven by Davey Allison, Jack Arood is with him. And already they're beginning to calculate fuel mileage. And Robert Yates, you figure that you're going to need one full can in the next stop. Is that correct? Well, we need to be about eight to ten gallons, but the important thing is to pit with somebody that's quick. You know, if you pit a little bit early, and, and you're going to lose three or four mile an hour out there by yourself. Okay, who's your choice if you've got to pit with somebody? Who do you want them to pit with? Uh, all these guys that are up front, they're pretty good. Uh, Morgan seems to be awful strong. Uh, 25 cars are super strong, and uh, also Bill. So any of those guys, uh, I guess we'd like to pit with them. I don't know if 
if Alabama has a lottery, but it sounds like he's picking numbers for the Florida lottery. <laughs> and don't forget, on lap number 149, we'll have the tire rule in effect, and that means that you can't switch brands. Davey Allison leads, and while we have the opportunity here, let's mention some other winners in recent competition. Tommy Ellis, the winner at South Boston last night in Bush Grand National Competition. Also last night, closer to home, or closer to where we are, in Birmingham, Bobby Donner won the All-Pro race, and yesterday, an exciting race here at Talladega. The ARCA bumper to bumper 500 won by Tracy Lutzley. Now let's go down to the pit area once again and Jack Aroot, or rather, uh, do, yeah, Jerry, Jerry Punch. Sorry, Jerry, go ahead. Well, it's, cl well, it's close. He's a little bit older than I am, but uh, <laughs> no. And not as good looking. Yes. There you go. Now we're, we're in the Valvoline pits with Morgan Shepard, Carl, and Butch Mock. And Butch, Jack Aroot just talked to Robert Gates and said they're going to have to come in for one can. That's what you told me you guys are going to have to do too, but do you have a pitting partner? you got to have someone to come in and pit with you when you do. Well, we haven't quite reached that stage yet, but yeah, we've discussed it, and uh, obviously when two cars team up, Davey's car's real fast, ours is running real good, and uh, if we feel we can get away with them, we need to pit at the same time so we can get out, but we haven't reached the stage where one can's enough yet, but uh, we'll see what happens. Maybe a high-level discussion here on pit road as a member from the Valvoline crew goes down to the member of a Havoline crew, and they decide if they're going to pit together and possibly decide it among the two of them, between the two of us, who's going to win it here in the next 20 or 30 laps. Gentlemen? Well, the Raymond crew has to be very excited and very happy, and Morgan Shepard also has to be because of their performance here. Morgan has not set the world on fire in Winston Cup competition so far this year, but is certainly turning at a strong, strong performance at Talladega. Let me tell you something. Four, the three out of the four cars, Davey Allison, Morgan Shepard, and Neil Bonnet. Take Dale Earnhardt now because he's won a race. He's run pretty good. Neither of those guys have had anything to cheer about. They've had terrible years in 1989. All of them could use this race to take them on to the rest of the season. Now, when you look among this group, and we always think about first-time winners here at Talladega, but uh, everybody in that group has a Winston Cup win. So we're not, well, with the exception of Mark Martin. So they're the first six cars, and you can see how Ken Schrader there in seventh position and beginning to catch up to the others. Now we have three cars running here in a draft, and that is Harry, Harry Gant, Gant, Gary Labonte, and Sterling Marlin have hooked up, and they're gaining on that front group. They pulled away from that second uh, group of cars that Gant was heading up not too long ago. If we look out the rear window of Harry Gant's car, Terry Labonte and the Budweiser Ford, and right behind him is Sterling Marlin in the Sunoco Osmobile. Now we're going to let these guys go out of frame and look at this bunch of cars that are about a half a straightaway behind. And that is Alan Kowicki that leads this group of cars down the backstretch. Also there, Phil Parsons and Lake Speed and Rusty Wallace and Jeff Bodine and Dale Earn, rather Daryl Waltrip and Rick Wilson and others as we are in Rusty Wallace's car now as he follows Lake Speed. And there's the bumper cam from Rusty Wallace's car as we look back at Jeff Bodine. Bodine, meanwhile, is looking at Rusty Wallace. And decides he wants to pass him. He wants to look at him from another angle. He's going to go down the inside, or at least he's going to try. Let us just take a side view. I think he did that for our purpose, so we can look up and take I a side so. view. That's very nice of him. Yep. <laughs> A.J. Foyt still in the race, right behind the Rick Wilson automobile. Kyle Pett is back there. those cars in the lead lap. Darrell Walter is still in the lead lap. Brett Bodine is still in the lead lap. So is Alan Kowicki. Light yep. speed there is, uh, is in the lead lap. We have 20 cars. So there is A.J. Foyt there on the left running with Jeff Bodine. And a week from today, ESPN and yours truly and several others will be at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway for second day time trials for this year's Indianapolis 500. You can bet that A.J. Foyt will be there. Kyle Petty behind A.J. Foyt. That's the Gary Nelson uh, car, of course, that he is preparing this year. Gary joining us on occasion for our broadcast, but this week devoting full time to making that number 42 peak sponsored car run for Kyle Petty. Once again with Jeff Bodine. I don't think Ned and I will join you next week, Bob. You know, I, no, we couldn't help you too much up there in Indianapolis. Chrissy Konamaki and Johnny Rutherford will be in the booth with me in Indianapolis next week. Jerry Punch with more on spoilers.
Well, gentlemen, as they make the final pit stop here in about uh, the next 10 or 15 laps, you're looking at the spoiler. That's the rear plate on the rear deck there on the 42 car that will actually catch wind and allow you to go fast or keep the car planted to the racetrack. Now, on this final pit stop, some of the crews may take an op opportunity to push down on that rear spoiler, but they've got to be very, very careful. Remember the spoiler rule here at Talladega, a minimum of 20 degrees. And Dick Beatty, NASCAR's chief here for inspection, made it very plain in the driver's meeting. Gentlemen, when those cars come in the garage area, you better not touch those spoilers. We're going to have an inspector go over with a gauge and put it on the car. Now, if your spoiler is less than 20, degrees, I don't care if it's 19 or 18, if it's less than 20, there will be no fines, there will be no penalties, you will purely be disqualified. That's a critical, critical mistake that the crew is made sure they cannot make on this final pit stop. Gentlemen? Well, look at Jeff Bodine, who has taken the high road. Boy, he was way up by the He fence. scared me to death. Man, oh, man. And here comes Daryl Waltrip trailing this group of cars in the number 17 movement. And now, if he were to win here today, and it doesn't look good, quite frankly, for Daryl Waltrip, but he would pick up that $100,000 bonus for winning two of the three races. And, of course, if you win three of the four races, you win a million dollars. And now, back up front, it is still a single-file formation with Davey Allison showing the way over Morgan Shepard, Dale Earnhardt, Neil Bonnet, and Bill Elliott. 149 laps are complete. Caution period on uh, the 150th lap, and the leaders, Davey Allison on the top and Morgan Shepard on the bottom as their respective crews go to work. Morgan is going to get out fast. He leaves the pits already with two tire changes, and Davey Allison is going to get a four-tire change. Remember, we are under caution now because of Greg Sachs, who has come in contact with the wall over in turn number two, and there is his car. Greg Sachs bringing out our fifth caution period of the day. And now some of the cars begin to move out of pit road, including Allison. And here's Jack Aroot with a call to the Daryl Waltrip stop. Well, the problem that has been plaguing Daryl Waltrip is a rubber that they put on the right front spring. They were trying to take it out the last time during caution, and now the crew is going back to work again with a big wrench, and they're trying to pull that rubber out. They've accomplished the task, and now they're going to put the tire back on, and they're going to, as you can see from the crew cam, Eddie Dickerson goes to work. He completes his task, and they are going to change all four tires. Now, he's at the back of the pack, so he can have the luxury of this because pit position isn't all as important to him as others. So they're going to take him to work here. Let's check in with Jerry Bunch. Well, we, we mentioned Morgan Shepard a bit in a minute ago. He did not change tires. He simply looked at the four Hoosier tires that were on his car, added a can and a half of gasoline, whereas Davey Allison did make a four-tire change. Could be a critical move. Remember, tire wear isn't that important here, but fellows up in the booth, I wonder if that'll affect them on all these last 20 laps or so. But it'll be interesting to see. Let's take a look at the replay of the crash of Greg Sachs. He was already down on the inside, slipped back up into the track, clipped the wall on the outside, then shot back down across the racetrack. And you can see the pieces flying from the car as it comes to rest down on the grass area. I just watched Greg Sachs just a couple of laps before that, just before that, and he was with Michael Waltrip and Jim Sauter. And Jack Arut has uh, an answer to one of our questions. Well, actually, an answer to what Jerry had, had supposed about Morgan Shepard coming on. And Jerry, as you said, Morgan uh, didn't take on tires. And these, this crew up at my side with uh, Davey Allison, they did. They had to, Jerry, because of the fact that during the last caution period, they elected not to take any tires on. They did a gas and go, and they were gambling on fuel. And with the caution coming out now, they said, hey, we better change tires now. We've got the luxury of time. And Jack Wood Brothers did a great job of getting Neil Bonnet out. Also, we might mention Neil Bonnet in the Citgo Ford. He did not change tires either. They had fuel in the car, so he brought him in and put one can of fuel in. I hope that's going to be enough. It should be enough. We have 152 laps complete, 188 comprised. That's Winston 500, so it should be enough for Neil Bonnet. But that put him up front, so they're hoping possibly the Citgo Ford will have a shot at winning it. Well, it's interesting that the two cars that did not take on tires, Morgan Shepard and Neil Bonnet, both are on Hoosier tires now and will be on Hoosier tires the rest of the race. So we're setting up now for the conclusion of the Winston 500 here at Talladega. 152 laps complete out of 188. Greg Sachs' car is being pulled into the garage area after having hit the wall. 
And the signal has gone out to the drivers on the racetrack that next time around, we will be getting the green flag. Well, our continuing coverage of NASCAR Winston Cup Racing has brought us to the very deep south for stop number nine on the 1988 schedule. Let's travel beyond the gates to see what's nearby Talladega Super Speedway. The town of Talladega is a small one located about 40 miles east of Birmingham. Just outside the gates of the track, but still on the Speedway property, is the International Motorsports Hall of Fame, where race fans can step back into the past to relive some great moments. The great Fireball Roberts swept both races at Daytona in 1962 in this Smoky Unique prepared car. Also on display, what was then the world's fastest race car that Art Malone drove here at Talladega. Curtis Turner was the NASCAR convertible champion in this number 26 Ford. A wide variety of cars are on display, including passenger cars and even sprint cars. Also, just beyond the gates of Talladega Super Speedway, last Friday night, our Benny Parsons was auctioning off one of his hats of the week for the Alabama Institute for the Blind and Deaf. Bill Barkdahl was the auctioneer, and the bidding was fast and furious between Bill Elliott and Davey Allison. The winner, Davey Allison, he pays $350 for the hat, but the real winner, the Alabama Institute for the Blind and Deaf. Boy, that was a wild, wild time, that auction. Bill, Bill Barkdahl, what an auctioneer that guy is. He's also a very fine race driver, has shown uh, quite a bit of uh, ability and strength here today. And now the green flag comes out on lap number 154. As we resume competition, and Neil Bonnet is leading the Winston 500. Bill Elliott was riding along second in the course. Mellon for Thunderbird didn't get a good jump. And look at Morgan Shepard going for the lead by Neil Bonnet. And Shep he has it. Oh, Shepard looks so strong. Well, he really does. Harry Gann is to the inside. And he goes into second place, passing Neil Bonnet. Here comes Mark Martin along in car number six. And Martin has third, forcing Neil high on the racetrack. Neil's trying to come back on the outside. Now, Phil Elliott will choose Neil Bonnet. That's who will win this race. But if Elliott chooses Mark Martin, that's who's going to win. But if Harry Gant and Morgan Shepard can stay hooked up like they are there right now, they could possibly pull away. And those two North Carolina neighbors, Morgan living in Conover, and about uh, 15 miles north of there is Taylorsville. That's where Harry Gant lives. Both of them started their racing careers at the Hickory Speedway at Hickory, North Carolina. And, in fact, I had the good fortune of seeing both of those race drivers start their driving career at Hickory on the dirt track there. And here they are, battling it out for the Winston 500. Terry Labonte has joined the number six car of Mark Martin on the inside. That's Ricky Rudd at number 26. Here comes Davey Allison also on the inside line. Davey came out of the pits, what, in 10th place on the restart as a result of taking on four tires. There he is right behind the bud car of Terry Labonte in car number 11. Bill Parsons back there. All of those drivers scrambling. Still at least 20 cars in the lead lap. In terms of car strength today, it seems to me that the two strongest cars, or among the two strongest cars, have been Davey Allison and Morgan Shepard, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything. Well, I agree with you, but I think we have to put Harry Gant in that category yep. because he had run strong up there with them early, and then he had an unscheduled pit stop and just never got back in sequence with them, but he's back there now in sequence. Right there with Morgan Shepard. Good job of pulling away a little bit from that pack. And now Bill Elliott is hung on the outside as Davey comes to the inside. So does Terry Labonte. And now Bill moves down on the track to uh, drop in behind Davey Elliott. Bill Bonnet was waiting for somebody to come along pick him up and, and help to push him up there to the front two cars. Once they got by him, he didn't really have that much help. But now Terry Labonte and Davey Allison come along. They're going to give somebody some help. Might be helping themselves. <laughs> so Harry Gant looking for another win this 
this year in Winston Cup competition. He, of course, was the winner of the race we televised earlier in Darlington. And our question that we had to Harry Gant over the weekend, a very simple one. Can you win this race here this weekend at Talladega Super Speedway? Definitely. Definitely. It's a good car. I know it's mobile. We have here is the same car that Phil won the race here in. Same car. So uh, we got a, an engine that's uh, going to be real strong. Be here tonight for the race, a race engine. And uh, it was similar to our practice engine. And, uh, you know, it would run 192, 93 miles an hour. So with the spoiler 20 degrees, I think we'll be able to run, you know, over 190 with the car. Well, indeed, here again, would like to win it here. As he said, it's the same car that Phil Parsons rode to victory here in the Winston 500 a year ago. But Gant had two engines built by Leo Jackson, and everyone knows how strong Leo is in the horsepower department. They brought one down for qualifying. It made about eight laps and then came apart. They had a problem with a tappet sticking in the top of the engine. They sent the sister engine down here, just arrived here late yesterday afternoon. That's what Gant was talking about. My engine will be here tonight. It came in. They put it in the car. They had their fingers crossed, hoping this engine would be as strong as the one they had for qualifying. And indeed, it's strong if not stronger, and yet would like to win it as they mix it up up front. Bob? Right at the trioval, we see some maneuvering going on as Terry Labonte and Mark Martin both separate themselves and go high on the track, leaving Neil Bonnet on the low line, and Neil begins to fall back. Morgan Shepard has the lead now, and look at Bonnet about to fall to the rear of this freight train. Well, you got five forwards running third through seventh position. You got Pontiac up front and Nosemobile running in second place. And look at the two guys that are catching up with Neil Bonnet. Davey was, had some hand signals going with his neighbor. We were talking just a moment ago about Harry Gant and Morgan Shepard being neighbors. So is Davey Allison and Neil Bonnet. Davey was motioning to Bill Cole. Darrell Walter on the bottom of the racetrack. He looked like he might have some of his problems behind him. Well, they did get that rubber out of that right front spring, which would have loosened the car up a little bit, I guess. And uh, maybe that's what he needed here for this year. The two cars that caught Neil Bonnet there are uh, Phil Parsons and Sterling Marlin, but this is the second group of cars now as we watch from Rusty Wallace's bumper cam back at the Jeff Bodine New Lumina. A little bit of breakup on the camera. Here comes Alan Kowicki and uh, Daryl Waltrip and several others, Rusty Wallace and Jeff Bodine and Phil Markdahl. Petty there in the number 42 car. That's Mark Dolan, 73 to the inside. Looking, Looking at the windshield of Jeff Bodine into Rusty Wallace there on the right side. He tried to make a move there, but there was no room down there. And now we'll look at the at the rear of Rusty Wallace's car. Now. victory here this afternoon, but he has one of the pits, right, Jack? Yeah, Bobby does, and here you see Victory Lane and all of the, the white landscaping marble that they use here, and activity starting to get underway here as we get ready for the end of this race. The crew came over here today, and they took one of these rocks, and they taped it to his dashboard, and they said, Daryl, bring it back to Victory Lane. Well, Daryl is going to try desperately, but right now he has Alan Kowicki and Ken Schrader and Dale Earnhardt ahead of him, and uh, he is... Well, Davey Allison now is caught on the bottom side of the racetrack. Now he moves back up into line. Darrell Walter shown in 20th position at the moment. No, he has moved up from that now, Bob. He is running in the uh, 13th position. So he has, has moved up from where he was a moment ago. But still far away from the lead draft that you are watching at the moment. It can be any one of these guys. In fact, it could be any one of 20 drivers who are still on the lead lap that could come out the victor of this race. And we're about 25 laps from the end. Car number 31 has spun off of the racetrack and has brought out our sixth caution period of the afternoon. His windshield is gone. When these cars spin out, Benny Parsons mentioned earlier those uh, straps, metal straps that they have to hold the windshield with all of that pressure going against them. When the car turns around, that wind will just snap it right out of there. 
The lead pack has taken the uh, caution flag on lap number 164, and you can see that no one has come in for a pit stop because of the uh, caution flag at the time it came out for the Sauter spin over there in turn number two. Nobody was able to duck into the pits quickly. We do expect a lot of pit stops to possibly hear those. Allison moves alongside Morgan Shepard. Let's see if anyone chooses to come in for a pit stop. As I mentioned, we're only we're now less than 25 laps from the end of the race. Everybody has enough fuel. So it doesn't appear as if... Dave's trying to trick him. He's that's, trying to trick him. Yeah, that's all he's doing. He's trying to... No, he's going to come into the pit. What? Yeah. No! no he's not. <laughs> <laughs> Little, little cat and mouse going on. He fooled on. me there for a second. <laughs> Terry, Terry Labonte was there also right behind him, just in case Davey went in. He was going to, too, but I don't think he was fooled very much by Allison's maneuver. We'll be back with more at Talladega after this. the yellow flag remains out. Let's go back and relive just a few minutes ago when Davey Allison tried to fake everybody out by leading them to believe that he was going to come down off the banking and make a pit stop. Boy, he almost convinced me. He came all the way down, <laughs> went past the yellow line, and then all of a sudden, he and Terry Labonte looked like he was going to, to do the same thing. Jack Aru, what was that all about? Well, we'll ask Robert Yates himself. Robert, what was all that faking out going down on pit road with Davey Allison? Oh, he'd like for everybody else to pit. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> You know, as long we've run over some debris before and had to bet on tires, it's really not a tire race. We don't, you know, we could run probably 500 miles on the tires, but uh, these are working pretty good now. We need to stay in there with Morgan. He's awful strong. Well, let, we've talked to the faker. Let's talk to the fake E now. Let's check in with Jerry Punch. Well, Jack, Morgan Shepard was not about to come down pit road for no way, shape, or form was he going to let Davey Allison pull him down pit road. And what we told you last time was Morgan Shepard came in and did not change tires. What we didn't tell you was he didn't change tires a time before that or the time before that, or the time before that. In fact, the tires that are on the car right now were put on on lap 100. That means if he runs the last uh, 20 or 12 laps or so, or 22 laps or so, he will have run 228 miles on the same set of Hoosiers. And Jack Arruda, I mean, that's great tire wear here at Talladega. Hey, Jerry, you know, yesterday in the ARCA, in the ARCA race, one of the crew members that spent the most time on pit road checking on tire wear was the fellow that calls the shots down there, Butch Mock and Bob Rahealy. They were going up and down like it was Sherlock Holmes, just checking over the tire wear. So maybe they know something everybody else doesn't. Well, we're going to see how all this shakes out here in just a moment as the pace car has its lights off, and he'll be ducking into the pit area and will not be faking anybody out. He will indeed be coming in as the field now begins to build up momentum and take the green flag for the start. There are 20 cars, 20 cars on the lead lap. 41 started this race. Now, the green flag is displayed by Harold Kinder and we're back to racing. It's Morgan Shepard leading with Davey Allison second, then Terry Devani and Mark Martin. Can you imagine a guy running all day long and finishing 20th? And be in the lead lap and run good all day long. That's well, look here. Morgan Shepard and Davey Allison have opened up a pretty good lead over Terry Labonte, who's running in third place. Labonte and Mark Martin. Larry Pearson is there, so is Ricky Rudd, but those two cars are not on the lead lap, and Harry Gant is fifth. Looks like Labonte's coming back now, Ned. He and Mark Martin have hooked up in the draft, and they're coming back on the rear bumper. Yep. Let's take off. Okay, what? Well, we have that speed shot. You can tell how fast those cars are going, can't you? They zip by pretty quickly, don't they? Four cars, and I think it's going to be decided between these four cars unless we have another caution flag because Ned, oh, here comes Harry again. Maybe he can run him down. Yep, Harry come out of that pack back there in a hurry. He was caught behind a couple of lap cars. Here's Davey Allison now trying to go for the lead. Yep, good fight good. that time. But Gant is definitely gaining on him, and I think he will be a factor. They're the top four cars. 
Gibson. And now we see Harry Gant also closing in quickly on the lead draft. And here is the view that Harry has as they go into the trioval. That's Mark Martin right ahead of him. And that is Harry on the Sunday afternoon drive at Talladega at over 195 miles an hour. Look how straight that right leg is. He's got that thing all the way to the floorboard. If you won't see it come up, at least what Rusty Wallace earlier in the race. And it looks so easy, Benny. It does look easy, doesn't it? And you know, the physical thing is not that difficult at Talladega. But it's what's going through it. It's mine. That, that's what's hard. Hey, how can I catch these guys? How can I get by them? Well, he's caught him. Now, how does he get by? That's the thing. That's the challenge that faces Harry Gant, but indeed, he has moved into fifth position. Dale Earnhardt in this group of cars here. Also, Ken Schrader, Daryl Waltrip, Alan Kowicki. These guys are now in the, the uh, crossing the line about to cross the line. They are maybe, what, uh, three seconds? Well, three, yeah, three seconds. Behind. Uh, now, just before this last caution came out, those three cars of Earnhardt, Schrader, and Waltrip had hooked up together, and they were gaining on the front-running cars, but uh, they got caught back in traffic there this time, and they got a lot of gain to do in a shorter period of time. Now, the front cars, we see these cars. Oh, here comes Schrader. He's trying to pass. That's going to slow him down just a little bit, but... If Strader's that much faster, maybe he will take him a little bit faster than Earnhardt can. But if those cars in front stay hooked up and stay in line, I don't think these guys will ever catch him. Oh, trouble up in turn four. We have a crash. First major crash of the afternoon, as a matter of fact, in turn number four. You can see several Richard cars Petty spinning off the track, including Richard Petty. Ernie Irvin is also spun. A major crash here. Michael Waltrip in the yellow car is involved and has suffered some damage. There's one of the Miller cars up on the right side. Larry, Larry Pearson. Pearson. Badly damaged in the right front of that car. Larry hit hard. Hard of fire. fire starting to burn there on the right front of Larry Pearson's car. He's broken the fuel pump off the automobile. There's the Larry Coke car. Larry Coke car. Ernie Irvin in car number two. Chad Little going by. There's Hut Strickland, the number 57 car that was involved. So our first major crash of the day yesterday, we had a 15-car pileup in the ARCA race. This wasn't quite that bad, but it did involve several cars on lap number 172. And there is Derek Cope, who is going over. That's Larry Pearson. If Larry Pearson is okay. I tell you what, Larry Pearson never in his life has hit anything as hard as he just hit the wall here in Talladega. Yeah, whatever it is he hit, he hit it hard. I would assume it was a wall. It could have been another car, but uh, he did hit hard. Now he's going to lay down there on the grass and get his breath a little bit. But it did look like he came out of the car under his own power. I've seen this movie, Bob. I starred in this movie. Let me tell you something. It's not a pretty movie. This is when it definitely is not fun replay of the accident. See if we can determine where and when it happened. We see two cars that are up into the wall at this point. That's the car number Derek 10 Cope. of Derek Cope. That's Kyle Petty sliding on the bottom of the racetrack and up high must be uh, That's Pearson up Pearson. against the wall on the outside. We see Richard Petty spinning on the bottom of the racetrack. Looks like Rick Wilson coming through. Here's another angle. Michael Waltrip. Michael Waltrip into the wall, and he comes back into the Pearson car, and there's where Ooh, Pearson yeah. hit the car hard, wall so hard, and you can see fire at that point mm. also coming out of the car. That was wow. definitely the best angle of, uh, of that crash. So. I guess that's Kyle Petty that's spinning, the front car that's spinning. Oh. And there's a car went right over Richard Petty. That yep. was Hutt Strickland, car number 57. Went but Richard right Petty over. did drive away, but Hutt Strickland just went right over the car. Bobby Hillen going through and Dick Trickle up, up on the racetrack. There's Chad Little automobile sitting there. Turn four is a junkyard and the medical uh, officials are there with Larry Pearson. But as you can see, he is walking away. And that is what we wanted to see. After a hard impact with a fourth turn wall, Larry Pearson appears to be OK. And the crowd is applauding his ability to do so. 
So our first major crash of the race comes very late on lap number 172. today at Talladega Super Speedway in Alabama and our first major crash of the race comes with less than 20 laps to go. There's one of the cars involved, uh, Derry Cope. Now here is a real-time replay of the crash from inside Jeff Bodine's car. the world did he do that oh, I don't know he couldn't say anything oh look at the hard impact that Larry Pearson takes into the wall cars of uh, Pearson and Cope sliding down the banking now here's another angle Hutt Strickland ran over the front end of Richard Petty's car that you saw there on the right side of your screen. There is Larry Pearson's very dabby, uh, badly damaged race car. Jerry Punch is with Hutt Strickland. Well, Hutt taking a deep breath. First of all, are you okay, Hutt? Oh, yeah, I'm okay, Jerry. It's just a shame, you know. The, all the guys on the team and really done a super job all day to keep us up there. And, uh, you know, just accidents do happen. And uh, Coming off turn four there, it looks like Mike Walter blew a tire or something we got in the wall and everybody jabbed on the brakes and it just wasn't any place for me to go but and i slowed down and somebody hit me in the back but uh i'm okay and you know just a just a shame what happened looked like your car went right over richard petty's car i mean did you see petty come by <laughs> no i didn't jerry uh you know I was, it's hard to tell who you hit or anything around 185 or 190 and uh you know it's just things happen so fast you don't ever know who you hit or anything Hutt Strickland out of it. Larry Pearson took a heavy lick down there, but the good news, he did walk to the infield ambulance to be taken to the care center. We'll try to get a comment from Larry in just a few moments. Bob? All right, thank you, Jerry, and we're glad to see Hutt is okay. So the spectators once again sit down in their chairs, ready now for the finish of this race. The top 15, Shepard, Allison, Labonte, Mark Martin, and Bill Elliott. Six through 10, Gant, Neil Bonnet, Dale Earnhardt, Ken Schrader, and Daryl Waltrip. And then 11th is Sterling Marlin, 12th is Alan Kowicki, then Phil Parsons, Rusty Wallace, and NASCAR from Talladega, Alabama, live here on ESPN on this Sunday afternoon. And we are near the end of this race, and another race updates the crew chief on the Davy Allison car. Well, Bob, Robert's been talking back and forth to Davy Allison, and you've taken your look at your tactics, and uh, what's the story? Well, Morgan's is strong, and... Uh, you know, if we can figure out some way, but he's been back here a good while and tried a few things, and uh, we're not sure we can do it, but we haven't given up yet. What Davey had said, Jerry Punch, is that the leader, Morgan Shepard, has a lot of leg, but one fellow that doesn't have a lot of leg right now, he's out of the races with you. And he's limping. He just came out of the infield care center. That's Larry Pearson. Larry, first of all, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine, Jerry. Just knocked the breath out of me, and I hurt my right foot a little bit, but it'll be okay. What happened up there? Well, I don't know. Uh, to be honest with you, uh, Somebody said uh, Mike Waltrip went up and uh, hit the wall and came back down and got into me and turned me head on into the wall, but uh, I, I really don't know. I, I just I can't say. Well, Ricky Pearson's okay, but that uh, Chattanooga Chew Buick is totally destroyed, wiped out of his father, uh, David, and uh, brothers Ricky were looking at a tough break for the Pearson clan. Now, the guys that drove through all that debris on the racetrack, they should have some concern, I would think, at this point about how their tires are going to react when we go green again. Yeah, they have to be concerned, Bob, but they... When no one made a pit stop, the others couldn't afford to to give up the track position. But they've got to be, you know, a little bit cautious there, wondering if they did run over something. I tell you what, the crews are sitting down there in the, in the pits right now with the tires on the wall and the jack is ready, just in case there is a flat tire, because you're right. Very, very difficult to run through around the racetrack and not have a flat tire. Morgan Shepard leads this race in a Pontiac. Richard Petty, the last to win in a Pontiac here, May of 1983. The pace car comes off the track, and on lap number 176, they will get the green flag for the final 12 laps of race. Morning is out. Morgan Shepard is going to lead him down with Davey Allison running second. Then comes Terry Labonte, Mark Martin, Bill Elliott, Harry Gant, Neil Bonnet, and others, including Earnhardt, Schrader, and Daryl Waltrip, the Lumina guys. And Bill Elliott in the thick of that battle as well. Is anybody going to be able to catch Morgan Shepard, who has been very strong all race long? 
good qualifying effort. Start at sixth. Has been right up there all afternoon long, but Davey Allison has also had a very strong car. Harry Kent trying to get by Bill Elliott, and those guys need to get in line. They're in jeopardy of getting left if they don't get back in line. They did get back in line. Well, these four cars are in line up front. That's Morgan Shepard, Davey Allison, Terry Labonte. Looks and like Harry Kent. They're running through some oil dry up there in the fourth turn. That's the reason you saw a little bit of a cloud of dust picked up by the cars as they passed through that crash scene. Dave Allison now right on the rear spoiler of Morgan Shepard's car. You know, way back in this race, when Morgan was leading, he thought he had a flat tire, made an unscheduled pit stop, got a lap down, but he got it back. But he thought he had a flat tire. And we speculated, and we think that if it was the case that it had lift on the car, maybe Davey Allison's going to try that trick again. Well, there are about 20 drivers right now who are trying to decide where they're going to be and where they want to be as we approach the end of this race. We sampled their opinion earlier in the weekend. Number one, the hard to pass. And, and I've always had, a, pretty much always had a philosophy that Better for the guy behind me, behind me to think, wonder what I'm going to do than me be back there wondering what he's going to do. No doubt leading. I mean, I wouldn't. I mean, boy, it's, it's sure hard to pass. I sure. I mean, if I'm if I'm not leading, then I have nothing to lose by by going for it. But uh, you know, by pulling out and trying to pass. I want to be leading. Yeah, definitely want to be leading. That's the place to be. Here. You know, you used to want to be in second and pull out and slingshot by him last lap. That was, you could almost count on that happening. Now I'm not so sure that's the place to be. Uh, leading may be the best place. I don't want to be in front. I don't know where I want to be in front, baby. I might can tell you five laps to go. How about calling in, I'll tell you. There are nine laps to go. And right now it is Morgan Shepard who is in the position that most drivers said they want to be in front but Davey Allison is knocking on the door and look at the Lumina contention working the inside with Daryl Waltrip, Dale Earnhardt and Ken Schrader. Daryl Waltrip is coming on strong down on the inside. He has had help from the other Lumina Chevrolets of Dale Earnhardt and Ken Schrader. But by golly he passed Bill Elliott and several other cars and just caught that lead pack. It's well, time to pick the winners. Benny. Oh, I gotta go with Davey Allison. He's been strong all day. Ned? Well, I'm going to go out on the limb and pick Morgan Shepard. I'm, <laughs> okay. I'm going to say that Morgan Shepard is going to win it also. Jack and Rose in pit area, who do you think? Well, I've been with Davey Allison all day, and I'm going to have to absolutely pick him as he goes for the front right now, so maybe we're going to pull it off. But how about you, Jerry Punch? I tell you, Davey looks awful strong, but I'm going to go with the sleeper, a car I think has been running better and better week after week, and that is Terry Labonte. Junior Johnson has not won here since 1982 when he did it with Darrell Waltrip, and Labonte is my pick. I changed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I believe I will too. Uh, can you do that? It's late in the game. Now it's Davey Allison in a Ford and Terry Labonte in a Ford and Mark Martin in a Ford running up front. But look at this. Here's the Lumina gang led by Daryl Waltrip and Dale Earnhardt as they battle side by side for fifth position. But as they battle side by side, Bob, they're losing ground to that front four cars. They're going to have to get in single file or they're going to be left out to dry. Now, two points. First of all, a Ford has not won in 1989. The last time that the Ford went winless through the first eight races of a season was back in 1983. And there are Fords up front right now. The first three are Fords. But look at this action behind the leaders as Harry Gant and Dale Earnhardt and Daryl Waltrip and Ken Schrader are side by side going for the positions. Now, what do these guys tell their sponsors on Monday morning? There's 11 of them within one second of winning the race. Do they call on Monday and say, hey, I was one second out of winning? Where'd you finish? 11. <laughs> <laughs> the last lap turned at 193.065 miles an hour. Now, also, when you talk about first-time winners, which Talladega is famous for, Mark Martin, who is running third at this point, is very much in contention for the win. And all this is going to be decided in the next seven laps. But look at this side-by-side -side action. Now they're four abreast for the trioval. Four of them crossed the line at exactly the same time, and three of them are the new Luminas. And they made it. That's the amazing thing, and they made it. <laughs> Oh, no, Bill Elliott and Earnhardt almost collided Boy, up there. Dale slipped.
slid way high on the track and almost nailed Elliott. And do you think anybody can tell NASCAR how to take these, these restrictions on NASCAR? Well, yeah, it's going to be difficult to uh, convince NASCAR that this ain't fun, I'll tell you. Now, there are the first three. It is Davey Allison, Terry Labonte, and Mark Martin. What do you think scoring? Morgan Shepard is... I thought he was slowing down, but there's another car. Oh, well, Morgan has, has definitely lost the draft of those front three cars. And uh, has and, uh, almost lost his chance to win. Apparently, uh, Morgan Shepard has radioed his crew saying, I give up. The Fords are too strong. Well, he's not going to give up. You can bet on that. But he has to be disappointed in seeing these Fords running in the front right now. There is Elliott and Harry Gann. Mark Martin is telling his crew that he's going to try to push Terry Labonte out in front. And where he goes, Mark Martin is going to go. Oh, man. <laughs> well, Terry Labonte has been in the thick of several last lap finishes here at Talladega. Has not been victor either one of them, but he's been in the middle of several of those races right down to the wire. And he'd certainly like to come out in front. They, we talked about hand signals at the beginning. Or during the show, we talked about hand signals. If Labonte could just talk to Mark Martin person to person for five seconds right now, they could win the race. But I don't know if they can figure it out using their hands through the rear window and the windshield. If Terry Labonte, a number 11, can win this race, it'll give Junior Johnson his first super speedway win since Neil Bonnet did it at Rockingham in 1986. Right now, Labonte runs second, and Mark Martin, who has never won a Winston Cup race, is third. And what do you suppose is going through his mind at the moment? Now, there are the first three, but back in fourth, fifth, and sixth position are Neil Bonnet, Morgan they Shepherd. got Morgan Shepard, yeah, Daryl Waltrip, and Ken Schrader. Yeah, that Waltrip and Schrader have broken loose from that pack behind them and have caught Morgan Shepard. Morgan had lost the draft in the front three cars, so you have two threesomes that are running up front about uh, three seconds apart. There are three laps to go around this 2.66-mile racetrack. We're watching fourth, fifth, and sixth. Shepard, Daryl Waltrip, and Ken Schrader. And now show you an interval back to another pack of cars and there they come more cars involved in this freight train down the back stretch dr jerry punch has a comment on terry labani in second position at the moment just spoke with junior johnson he said this last time by he just turned labani loose i'm not going to talk to you again until we go to victory lanes and it's all yours big boy take the budweiser car and go to the front if you beat that 28 in the line twice on caution flights today do it one more time and i'll meet you in victory lane junior said i'm not going to talk anymore it's all yours less than two laps to go jerry before we'll have a winner in the winston 500 it is davy allison up front followed by terry labani and mark martin since the green flag came back out, Bob, the fans have been on their feet. None of them has sat back down. They're waiting for the outcome of this thing, and it is going to be exciting. <laughs> One and a quarter laps. That's all. One and a quarter laps. About 55, 60 seconds. About one minute. And they're still scrambling for position behind the leaders. As Rusty Wallace is right there, but it is do or die time for these first three cars. They cross the stripe and get the white flag. There is one more lap to go. Now what has to happen here is that Terry Labonte has to pull out and Mark Martin go with them. They gotta build up some momentum together if they have any shot of moving around Davy Allison. They might not even be able to build up that much momentum. Down the back stretch for the final time. Terry Labonte is looking, looking right, looking left. Can't find the opportunity he needs. Davy Allison is right there in the middle of the racetrack. Let's see what Terry Labonte can do, if anything, and what Mark Martin can do. It could be that they'll just have to stay in line and finish this way. Here they come into the tri-oval. The slow car will help. The slow car will help Davy Allison. Let's, let's over, Davy. Get some air. Let's watch. It's Davy Allison coming to the stripe. Terry Labonte right behind him. I don't think he's going to do it. No. Davy Allison wins the Winston 500 with Terry Labonte second.
Jackaroon is with Robert Yates. Well, Robert Yates has won this race as a car owner. He's talking to the Motor Racing Network right now. And Robert, congratulations, Robert. You did it. <laughs> I'm happy. I'm happy. Guys are just the best. You know, it's been tough, but this is great. Hey, what about what you told me before? You said, boy, that Shepard has got just too much leg. I don't think we're going to be able to do it. What happened to all that? I don't know, but something must have happened to him because uh, he had been awful strong. And, uh, here we are. Can't really believe it. First victory of 1989. How does it feel? First victory. First victory. All by myself. The best bunch of pit crew and uh, sponsor, Davey Allison, that anybody's ever had. Well, they've got to go real quick because they want to go to victory lane. And believe me, they know where it is. Davey Allison won the Winston 500 by running the last lap at 193.455 miles an hour. He needed it to hold off the challenge of Terry Labonte and Mark Martin. As he goes to victory lane, we'll take another break. And Davey Allison has won the Winston 500. We go to victory lane where our winner's circle interview is being brought to you by America's best-selling replacement battery, the Sears Die Hard. Here's Jerry Punch. Well, they are celebrating here in Alabama. Davey Allison, congratulations on a super victory. Thanks, Jerry. I just want to tell you one thing. I love Robert Yates. He, this is his first win as a car owner, and he's the greatest. You know, uh, there's just so many people we ought to thank that, that have been great. The whole team has done a super job, but there's a couple of special people out there I want to say hello to. Ray Fox Sr. has had an operation, open heart surgery this week, and he's recuperating down in Florida right now. And uh, a friend of mine, uh, Jimmy, Jimmy Green at home, he's watching on television. Now, the Stricker Flake was not a popular piece of equipment before the day started, but a lot of drivers of this kind of competition have got to like it. You've got to be a fan all of a sudden. Well, I tell you, Robert and all the guys at the engine shop have just done a super job working with the uh, restrictor plate on the dyno. And I tell you, I owe it all to them. I got the easy job. I get to sit out there and steer this great driving race car. You talk about an easy job. Now, what was going through your mind those last three or four laps? Here's Labonte, and there's Martin Martin. Both of them are in strong mount. Well, you know, the last race I won here, Terry finished second, and I was worried about him then, too. And I was worried about him today because he looked awful strong out there. Now, you did a little pick and roll there on the end of pit road one time, trying to fake him out, trying to fake Shepard. Did you thought you could get him to make a pit stop late in the race? Well, I was trying to get a couple of those guys out of the line, trying to fake them off. But these guys are all smart, and that's why they're on the Winston Cup circuit. And uh, they knew what was going on. Got to be even more special because your dad, Bobby, who won this race a few years ago, is here to see you win it. He is not down in victory lane, but trying to get here. He was up in the suite watching it. He's got to be in tears right now. No, there, and there's a lot of my family here, but most importantly, my dad, because he's the one that made this all possible for me. He's the one that gave me the background. And he's up there, and I love him to death. Him and my mom both. Take it home, Alabama. Davey Allison back in victory lane, winning the Winston 500. Bob? He won the Winston 500 in 1987, and he comes home with the victory here today, giving Ford its first win of the 1989 Winston Cup season. Well, the top five finishers in the Winston 500, Davey Allison, Terry Labonte, Mark Martin, Morgan Shepard finishes in fourth place, and Darrell Waltrip was in fifth. And there are the second five as we have concluded in an extremely exciting afternoon of competition here at Talladega Super Speedway. The Winston Cup point standing unofficially, Dale Earnhardt leads with Darrell Waltrip second, and Jeff Bodine, Alan Kowicki, and Rusty Wallace. My thanks to Ned Jarrett, Benny Parsons, Jack Aroot, and Dr. Jerry Punch for their help this afternoon. We'll see you on Speed Week Thursday night at 7.30 at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway next Sunday for time trials. For now, this is Bob.